Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of Reddit Podcast Stories, where today, my Karen coworker is trying to text my husband behind my back. Yesterday, we had year-end inventory day at my new job that I started three months ago. I, 35 female, was asked to bring a friend as my partner to help. We all brought our husbands and wives, others brought their kids, others brought their boyfriends, etc. I brought my husband, who's 36. My one coworker, 34 female, did not bring anyone. She just helped each group of partners throughout the day. Everything was going great and we had a wonderful day and inventory was nearly perfect, so we all got praised. Anyways, the next morning I get to work at 8 a.m. and four minutes into my day, my coworker, who did not bring anyone, asked if my husband has a brother that's single and specifically looks exactly like him. I said no, he only has a sister. She said, oh, that's a shame, so he doesn't have a brother? Me again, no, why, do you have a crush on my husband? She literally laughed like a schoolgirl. Let me start by saying that I am far from jealous. I know my husband is attractive, I know I am too. I know my husband is successful, I know I am too. I know my husband is hilarious, kind, and makes everyone feel heard and important. That's the exact reason I married him. I thought it was cute she liked him, and this did not upset me. She then went on to talk about him almost any chance she could for the entirety of the day. And again, this did not upset me. At all. He's most likely not coming back here, at least until next year inventory day. She's having a crush, and it'll pass by next week. What did upset me, when I got home at 4.30pm, he showed me that at 1.24pm she texted him, and I quote, Hey, spelled his name wrong. How are you today? Your lady is really bothering me. So this woman went into our system, found my husband's phone number, and deemed it okay to text him in this manner. Of course he did not respond. Of course he thought it was absolutely insane. And now I'm getting ready for work today, and I'll see her in the next hour and a half after her doing this, and I'm not sure how I should or will react. Like I said, I'm very far from jealous. I understand crushes and feelings and emotions, etc., but someone going to this level to contact my husband turns me into a grizzly bear. Would I be the jerk if I told HR that she did this? We work for a very large billion dollar company who takes these things very seriously. She'd essentially lose her job. Update. First, just clarifying, my husband and all the other helpers were paid very well for their work. And the people who brought their kids, they were about 24 or older. We need 10 extra people for one day. It wasn't slave work. We had a great day and it was nice introducing my husband to everyone and meeting others' wives. We're going through a very large merger at work and today was very busy. I did tell my assistant manager what had happened, showed him the photo of the text message and explained that I was very upset with my coworker. He was flabbergasted and tomorrow we'll sit down and tell our general manager what happened. He asked me what my resolution would look like but we both agreed that once the GM knows, it's not exactly up to me anyways because of the breach in privacy. I do feel terrible. I've done nothing but be nice to her. Even the, your lady is bothering me, wasn't warranted because I wasn't even bothering her. Not the jerk. Your coworker's behavior is way out of line. Going behind your back to contact your husband is a major breach of boundaries. It's understandable that you're upset about it and it's worth bringing to HR's attention to nip this thing in the bud. Am I the jerk for not telling my girlfriend I was going to break up with her if she went on vacation with male friends? Basically, my girlfriend went on vacation with her male friends. I told her this made me uncomfortable and I didn't want her to go. By the way, she used to hook up with one of them before she met me. She told me it would be fine and that they're like brothers to her. I already made the decision to break up with her right there and then, but I waited to get my stuff from her place before anything and I figured I should do that while she's gone. I also didn't want to break up over text or call, so I waited for her to come back. I picked her up when she came back, dropped her off, and gave her the key to her place back and broke up. She started crying and she figured out it was because of the vacation. She kept saying that nothing happened. I told her she knew I wasn't comfortable with this and she still went. She mentioned that I should have said that I'd break up with her if she went and that if she knew that, she never would have gone. I told her I didn't want to be controlling and threaten her with ending the relationship. We kept going back and forth over this for a while. Edit. More information since some of y'all are assuming a lot here. 1. She never actually introduced me to these friends. Even though I mentioned I wanted to meet them, she kept making excuses. 2. She never told me she used to hook up with her friend. I only found out 
because I found an old picture of them kissing when she was showing me some old travel pics. 3. I was okay with their friendship until now. This was just too much for me. Did she cheat on me? Who knows? But at this point, I was sick of doubting. Not the jerk. Also, the fact that she claims she wouldn't have gone if she had known you to break up over it, that doesn't make it any better. It makes it worse. It shows she doesn't care how it affects you unless it becomes a problem for her too. That's zero integrity and that's not long-term partner material. It should not take you leaving or thinking about leaving for her to not dismiss your feelings. That's asinine. Wow, someone on Reddit with a spine. Kudos to you. My wife and her ex-husband. My wife, 45 female, was married to Bob, 46 male, for almost a decade. They got divorced 12 years ago. There is a story behind it. Bob and my wife were college sweethearts. They got married very young and had been very happy. However, Bob got into an accident which led him to be paralyzed from the waist down. My wife was 29 and Bob was 30 back then. My wife took care of him for three years, but then she just gave up. She told Bob that she couldn't do this anymore. She knows that she sounded selfish, but she always wanted to have kids, but Bob couldn't have kids after the accident. She wanted to get a divorce, but promised him that she would always be there for him. She just wants to be selfish for once. Bob, although he was upset, he still understood. They split amicably. My wife stood by her promise and still visited Bob. She was still a part-time caretaker for him before she met me. I, 40 male, met her two years after her divorce. While we were dating, she made her situation with Bob clear that she will continue to see him. I know a lot of guys would be skeptical about this, but I just loved her the moment I saw her. Her kindness and compassion towards others is what drew me towards her. After we became official, she only went to see Bob once a week, sometimes even twice. I did not mind then. In fact, I liked her ex very much. He didn't treat me like I was the other man. He was always welcoming towards me and even showed me his library. I always felt bad for what happened to him. He was a great man and life had just betrayed him. When we got married, I could still see the sadness in his eyes, although there was a mix of emotions from him. I always felt that Bob never stopped loving my wife and to some degree, my wife still has feelings for him. I know she loves me a lot. She has always treated me like I'm her king and always showed her love to me. Seriously, I'm really lucky to have her in my life. Together, we have two kids who are seven and five. My kids are also close with Bob. Everything was fine until a few months ago. We got the news that Bob has cancer. It was at the last stage and he might not even survive a full year, but there's still a possibility. The news really broke my wife. She had stopped eating properly and being her usual cheerful self. I understand it, but here's where I'm a little uncomfortable. She now visits him very often. Most of the time, I will be there with her. And then a few weeks after the discovery, she told me she wants to shift in his house. She told me that Bob feels lonely and his siblings do not care about him since his accident. And it will be better if she would just stay with him. I objected. We had an argument and reached a compromise that we're both going to stay. So I've been staying at Bob's house for two weeks now. Four days ago, we were all having dinner and after we were finished, I decided to do the dishes. My wife and Bob were chatting. The conversation went like this. Bob, I really miss this. I miss talking to you like the good times. My wife, me too. Remember one time we talked so much that we were late for work the next day? It wasn't even important. Bob, what happened to us, Lily? I mean, we were something. People would use us as an example. I miss you a lot. Never thought that when I was dying, you wouldn't be my wife anymore. My wife, I know. At one point, I thought that too, but life had other plans. I mean, I love you but I love my family more. It was not the same after your accident. It's as if they forgot that I was in the kitchen and listening to their conversation. My wife was normal after that. We went to bed and kissed each other goodnight. I don't know how to feel about all of this. I trust my wife. I know she's a strong woman with good morals. She would never cheat on me. I know she's just sympathetic towards Bob because their relationship was beyond just exes. They are best friends. I feel like an intruder between them, and I think no matter what my opinion in all of this is, I will always be the bad guy. You're not the bad guy in a form. Know that. You need to talk to your wife about what you heard. Then you need to get to counseling with her and possibly Bob. Because when Bob does pass, you want to have everything settled. Because she may start saying things like, I lost the most important man to me. And then you're going to be severely pushed over the edge. OP. 
Therapy sounds good. I guess I knew deep down this would come. OP. She divorced because she was full-time his caretaker and couldn't do it any longer. Their marriage failed for that reason. There was no intimacy, no romance. She had a version of what kind of family she wanted and she had been clear with this from the beginning. She was young back then and had her whole life ahead. Now we have kids and our situation is very different from her first marriage. I know that if I get injured, she will not leave me. She's also in a better financial position than she was 12 years ago and we can hire nurses if one of us becomes injured. And I don't mind her going once a week to see Bob. Bob is also my friend too. I also visit him sometimes along with my wife. She spends time with me a lot. She has no other family except for Bob. This story makes me sad for all of you. It's understandable she's been upfront with you about this. She loves him and feels guilty she couldn't stay with him and have the life that she wanted. It's very sad. You would not have your wife if not for his accident. I wouldn't like this arrangement. It would be very uncomfortable, but you did sign up for this. How are your kids processing all of this? OP. They're mostly sad. Bob is getting weaker every second. They don't know he will be passing, but they are happy to see Bob. This is difficult for many reasons. Reading your post, it almost sounds like you want to be jealous, but I doubt that's really it. If it were jealousy, I feel that you would have had problems long ago. Have you considered that you're grieving for Bob, the man you called a friend? It's easier to be upset or hurt at your wife than to face his demise. It doesn't sound like there's anything for you to worry about from this relationship itself. It's just difficult emotionally, and that's understandable. You really should see a therapist to help you work through your emotions so you can be there to support your wife and kids when he passes. It won't be helpful if you're still suppressing both the hurt of knowing your wife loves someone else and the loss of a friend. OP. I'm devastated that I'm losing a dear friend of mine. I mean, Bob never even tried to hurt me or make me feel like a third man or a man who came between him and my wife. In 2020, I went into a deep depression due to stress of losing my job during lockdown. Bob, even though he was disabled, helped me and motivated me to keep going. He's a really good guy. Maybe you're right. I'm still in a mix of emotions. Update. All right, I took some of the advice that you guys gave me. Although I was disappointed to see so many emotional people calling me and my wife names without even trying to understand the situation, I want to make a few things clear. To those saying my wife is awful because she abandoned her husband, no, I disagree with that. There's a difference between terminating a marriage and abandoning. She didn't abandon Bob. She was right by his side. She was just not his wife. I can understand why. And those saying that my wife and Bob are having an emotional affair? No. People who have affairs are secretive. My wife was never like that. She was always upfront and honest about her relationship with Bob and how she would still want to care about him. I do not think there is any affair. Just because she said she loves him, so what? She says I love you to her kids, her friends, and even my mother. That doesn't mean she's having an affair with anyone else. She's kept a boundary between Bob and her. She doesn't love him romantically, but like a friend or family. She doesn't have her own family. She's been no contact with her family since she was 18. Bob was the only family she's ever known. If my wife wanted kids, why didn't she just adopt or do IVF? Like I said in my previous post, she was financially drained. IVF cost a lot here and adoption with a disabled parent is hard. The agencies hesitate to give a kid when one parent is not functional. Then again, they would still need money. My wife wanted to have kids of her own, and if they went to either of those routes, she would have been the one taking care of the baby most of the time along with her husband. Bob almost went broke during all of the caretaking. It wasn't until a few years ago he started a remote job that allowed him to stay at home and earn. My wife will leave me if the same thing happens to me. I doubt it, but even if she does, I would understand. We talked about this before getting married, that if we have tried every possible option, then one of us can divorce. I do not want to be a burden on my own wife. And we're both in our 40s. We have pretty much accomplished every goal in life. So if something like this were to happen, we're prepared. Bob loves my wife. He could, but there's not much I can do about it. I mean, I can't order him to stop loving her, but he does have feelings for her. Bob was in a long-term relationship for five years with another woman, but I do not think his love for my wife is the same as romantic love. Now on to the update. I took your advice. I just wanted to do the talk when she wasn't stressed. I texted my wife to meet us at our house, not Bob's. I ordered her favorite food and set up the table. When she arrived, she was surprised to see the setup and I just told her that since she has been stressed lately, I wanted to do something good for her. I called my mother, the kids are with her, 
Bob is staying at the hospital today, so he's fine too, and she can relax. She was happy and thanked me. We talked about our life, and she vented about her job and everything that's been going on. Then I dropped the bomb about the conversation with Bob. I told her about that conversation and how it made me feel. Well, I like Bob, and I know she loves me too, but I can't help but imagine her wanting to be with him, and it really hurts. Though I do appreciate her wanting to help Bob, I want to enforce boundaries. I cannot live forever in her ex's house. We have our own house. She needs to think about our kids too. I feel like day by day I'm losing her. This is just my concern and not insecurity. I expected her to flip out and become defensive, but she just cried a lot. She said that she didn't mean to hurt me. She knows she went too far with wanting to stay with Bob. She says she doesn't want Bob to feel alone. That's why she proposed it. And she feels sorry for not listening. She didn't mean to hurt me. She's been thinking about the living situation. I told her it's not enough. I wanted us to talk to a therapist. This whole thing is just a burden on me. She got scared and said, why? Nothing's wrong with us. I told her I want to do this. Just make sure we're on the same page and that there are no hard feelings on either side. Then I asked her if she still wishes to be with Bob because if he didn't have the accident, they would still be together. She told me she has wasted time thinking about what if. She knows we'd probably never meet or she and Bob could have divorced for a different reason. The thing is, she doesn't want to think about it. What happened just happened. She loves me and doesn't want to be with Bob. Bob has a place in her heart as a friend and family. When she said she loves Bob, it doesn't mean she's in love with him. She hasn't thought about him in a romantic way since their divorce. The only reason she stuck with Bob was because they promised each other no matter what happened, they will be with each other even as a friend. She promised that we move back home and only stay one day a week at Bob's house. She might do occasional visits when needed. I agreed, but I still insisted on going to therapy and she agreed to it. We have yet to tell Bob about the news but I'm sure he will understand. And before you ask, yes, Bob has a full-time nurse. He has family, but they hardly ever visit him. I'll probably not make an update again. I'm done. No matter how much I try to explain it to you guys, you would only stick to seeing things either in black or white. Apparently, in the Reddit world, two exes remaining good friends is considered an emotional affair. They don't need context to understand things. I'm also very much drained emotionally. Bob is also my friend. Seeing him getting weak every day just makes me feel hopeless too. I'm glad you had that conversation with her. I'm rooting for you. And yes, therapy. I always feel like therapy is like an oil charge. It's maintenance. If you don't do it, you're done for. But if you keep at it, you'll be running smoothly. I have a few therapists in my family, so it may be their influence. She may need individual therapy too. There's a lot to unpack for her. OP. Yes, we talked about that. I forgot to mention in my post. I told her that she needs to face the ugly reality that Bob might not be in our lives. She needs to prepare for that. She needs therapy for herself to navigate those feelings. She agreed to that. Communication. As much as people would like to vilify the two of you, you are both admirably navigating a sea of gray and doing the best you can. I'm disappointed by this sub's inability to do nuance. Marriage is nuanced. Marriage requires comfort with gray areas. Marriage requires constant give and take. Thank you for sharing this with us. OP. Yeah, I think people are way too self-righteous to think about any other possible solution. Yes, morally, she should have stayed with her ex and spent the rest of her life taking care of him, no matter how emotionally draining it is. But practically, it makes no sense. Wife. I know, I shouldn't have demanded to move in with my ex-husband. To compromise, I'll only stay with him one day a week. All the while, their own kids are displaced and have to stay with their grandparents. His wife wasn't having an emotional affair. They are in a throuple. She never really left her ex-husband. This went way past staying friends after the divorce. More power to OP. If my wife told me she was moving into her ex's place to take care of him on his deathbed, I would tell her to take all of her crap with her. I know this will be a very unpopular opinion, but OP's wife is a fantastic ex-wife, but a terrible wife and mother. She's put her ex and her feelings which a lot are probably revolving around easing her own guilt, above the feelings and wants and needs and dignity of her husband and kids. For crying out loud, she displaced her husband and shipped her kids off to grandma to move in with her ex, with whom she is in a relationship. They don't hook up, but this is very personal and an emotional relationship, aka what many marriages evolve into as people age. OP and his wife have an open marriage and a throuple, or whatever you want to call it. I've never even heard that throuple word before. And this is enough Reddit for one day. OP is in denial about it, and as long as he's okay with it, it's fine. 
Just call a spade a spade. But for crying out loud, they're both so enmeshed they don't realize that they're absent parents. I had a baby as a result of an affair and now his wife is reaching out to me. I, 26 female, had an affair with a married man, 42, a few years ago. I had no clue he was married when we first met and hooked up. I obviously looked him up on social media and while he did have photos of his kids on there, there was absolutely no mention or photos of a wife at all. I found out that he was married about a month after we first got together, but he told me it was just a marriage on paper and that they basically lived separate lives and agreed to remain married for practical purposes until the kids were older. They owned a business, which she really ran, and he was just financially involved in. I knew at the time that I probably shouldn't believe him, but I convinced myself it was true. I was in my early 20s and so attracted to him, and I guess almost infatuated with him. He made me feel so good. I know now that I should have ended it immediately, but I didn't realize what I was getting myself into. I was addicted to all of the attention he gave me, the places he'd take me. I felt special. I was so naive. I got pregnant about a year into seeing him. I had always been so careful with preventing pregnancy, but during my relationship with him, I took stupid risks. It's embarrassing. I was in love with him, or I thought I was. I hadn't intentionally wanted to get pregnant. I would of course dream about being his wife and having a family, but I knew that wouldn't be a possibility while he had this arrangement with his actual wife. I didn't get pregnant on purpose with any intention of him leaving her for me, even if I wished that we could be a real normal couple. I was surprised by how excited I was to be pregnant with his baby. I wanted that baby once I found out I was pregnant. The thought of carrying this baby of the man I loved was so special for me, but I knew he probably wouldn't feel the same way. I told him I was pregnant and he told me I couldn't keep the baby. I expected this reaction, but it hurt me to the core that he didn't feel the same way I did. He offered to pay to make a whole weekend of it somewhere exciting and to buy me something special if I just please get rid of it. He explained that he didn't want any more kids and that he couldn't openly be a father to another kid when he and his wife were still pretending to be happily married to the outside world. I agreed to do what he wanted and we made plans for him to pick me up and find somewhere out of town to go get it taken care of. I was all packed the night he was going to pick me up, but I started to feel really scared and really unsafe about the whole thing. I took my bag and checked myself into a hotel to hide because I couldn't go with him. I texted him to say I promised to never contact him again and to never name him as the father or go after him for child support if he had promised to leave me alone. At first, he tried to sweet talk me into doing what he wanted. When I didn't cave, he said some very mean things to me that I essentially better never contact him again or show up at his door. I have a two-year-old now. At times, it's been difficult, but overall, we are thriving as best we can. I've kept my word about not naming him as the father or requesting child support. His wife contacted me on social media. Well, she's his ex-wife now. She wants to talk to me. She found out about me and told me that she divorced him six months ago. She wants her kids to know their sibling and for my kid to know his siblings. That's weird to me. I haven't responded back to her yet. I'm unsure about how to approach this. How do I respond? I wonder if I'm being selfish by not exploring an option for my own kid to know his siblings, if she's being genuine about that. If I was married and my husband fathered a kid outside of our marriage, I don't think I'd feel the same way that she does. Are you sure this is truly his ex-wife contacting you? Could it be him using her account, or a fake account, to initiate contact with you for some twisted reason? Please be careful and make wise decisions if and when agreeing to meet this woman. I know you want to do the right thing. Just be very careful. So many people telling you to go for it for the sake of the kid and possible child support, but I would say that you have good instincts which served you well. Don't ignore them now. You're leading a happy life with your kid. You've survived so far without his financial help. Letting her and the kids into your lives will be inviting him back into your life too. You also don't know what her intentions are or if it's even her who's contacting you. No matter what, it will be inviting him back into your life in some way. He made you feel unsafe and wanted you to not have the baby. He also abandoned you and the baby. He cheated on his wife for a long time. He's not a good guy. I would say keep him out of your life and continue as you are. Am I the jerk for telling my daughter she sabotaged herself? My ex-wife and I, 51 male, have three kids together. We have two sons who are 15 and 13 and we have a daughter who's now 18. Their mother and I agreed on 50-50 custody arrangement after we split up and have stuck to it until this issue arose. My daughter hasn't spoken to me since last summer due to an argument she and I had about college. 
I have college funds for all three of my kids and had an agreement with them that they would receive it after graduating high school as long as they attended a state university, not community college. I wanted to set them up for success later on, and I know future employers would take them more seriously if their degree was from a legitimate four-year college. Last spring, my daughter and I got into an argument about this. She was filling out financial forms for college and asked me for my tax returns. While we were going over the forms, I noticed that she put down a local community college, and when I pointed it out, she told me that her mother encouraged her to because they waived the tuition fees for first-time college students so we wouldn't have to pay for any of it. I told her that she shouldn't be asking me for my information if she was going to use it to do something that I've made clear I don't support. She told me that she thought I just meant I was against paying for it, and I told her that I had been crystal clear and that she knew what I had meant and that she was being sneaky and taking the easy way out. Eventually, I stormed out. I figured that it would blow over by the next day, as it usually does when we have a fight. However, she told me a few days later that she reached out to the financial aid company and asked to submit the forms with only her mother's financial information. They ended up approving her request, but it was a long process and didn't get completed until after the deadline to enroll in most universities for the fall semester. As a result, she wasn't able to start college last semester and ended up getting a job instead. My daughter told me that since I clearly wasn't going to help her, that she would move in with her mother full time after she turned 18, which was during the summer, and she started college this semester. I told her that was ridiculous and that she was being petty and that she sabotaged herself and if she had just enrolled in a real college like I told her to, she would have been able to complete the paperwork without a problem. She told me that she hated me and was cold and distant to me until she moved out permanently. This was all during spring and summer of last year and my daughter hasn't spoken to me since. I pretty much forgot about it until my youngest son told me this morning that he misses her being there when they spend the week at my house and how he wishes I hadn't been so harsh. In retrospect, I guess I might have been too harsh with it. Rich groom plus poor bride equals entitled parents. This happened a few years ago, and to be fair, they weren't the worst couple I have dealt with in my career, but even so, they were jerks to work with. So the backstory. The groom was a rich businessman from the UK that was marrying a single mother from Africa. Based on the ways their families conducted themselves, it was clear to say that their backgrounds were vastly different. I had been hired to do the wedding video. I was shooting alone, rather uncomfortably I might add, as I had filmed a different wedding the day before and all the service providers had gotten light cases of food poisoning. Their wedding was on a Sunday and, as I had been hired by the bride's side of the family, their budget was fairly limited. Therefore, all pre-ceremony coverage had been cut from their package. I arrived about 30 minutes before the ceremony to see the groom cussing out the DJ about something. I don't actually know what. The ceremony started and didn't add much to the story. The bride's stupid lawn pin, my company's name for kids, was screaming throughout the entire ceremony, making it impossible to hear the sermon and making me feel oh so happy knowing that I was going to get tasked trying to clean up the audio after. Oh, the joys of wedding videos. Cut forward to after the ceremony, with everyone gathering for the couple to sign the register. The couple entered the room and saw something. Something horrendous. Something so devastating to their moment that not even God would have had the solution. Right there, right where they wanted to sign, there was a book lying on the table. Get the manager straight away! This book has to be removed! The jerk groom yelled to the closest person in earshot. It took me a moment to register what had just happened before I took a step towards the table, simply picking up the book and putting it back on the shelf. So you'd think that would be the end of it, right? With the obstacle now removed, that they could simply sign the papers and go on with their lives. Nah, this had upset them so much that the room had to be cleared while they took some time alone to rant about how inadequate everyone is and how this book had ruined their entire day. I'm not even joking. They really did say that the book had ruined their entire day. So eventually the dang register gets signed. The two most dramatic people in the world are now husband and wife and everyone is standing outside. Finally, the door opens. We wake up from our afternoon naps on our feet. The guests hold their hands, ready to throw confetti, only to see the MC walk through the door 
and announce that they won't be coming out, as the bride doesn't want the wind messing up her hair. If I had rolled my eyes any bigger, they would have come out of their sockets. Why? Because the bride, not the groom, but the bride was from this area, and she knew the wind never stops blowing. Did she think God was going to pause the weather for her while the rest of her guests stand outside burning in the sun for almost 15 minutes? Anyway, move forward to the reception. The couple shoot and the family photos had to be postponed to later because, for some reason, the bride thought the wind was going to change. This meant that everyone now entered the reception hall more than 90 minutes earlier than the schedule had stipulated. So what does the groom of the year do? He goes and yells at the wedding coordinator that the first course isn't ready yet. Needless to say, this caused some panic in the kitchen. I should further point out that this wasn't your average three-course meal. This was eight courses. So the schedule was something like this. Speech, course, speech, course, eight times. The opening of the dance floor, bouquet and garter, etc. I did my setup quickly as the first speech was about to commence. Only one problem. The number of guests was way too many for the venue's capacity, so there was literally no way for me to get anywhere near the bridal table or the podium where the speakers would be making their speeches. I set up as well as I could, a basic two-camera setup, and took a stand behind the main camera. During the speech, I glanced in the direction of my second camera only to see the bride's lawn pin is trying to climb up my tripod. How the camera didn't fall over might prove that there is a higher power up in the clouds, but nonetheless, I sprinted towards it, grabbing the kid before he could knock over the camera. I put him down, telling him politely not to touch it. The camera had moved during the kid's action and was now no longer pointing in any kind of relevant direction. I glanced back at my main camera, only to see that the speaker was no longer standing behind the podium and had gone to stand directly behind the couple. I had missed it completely. I sprinted back to my main camera, readjusted the shot, glanced back at my second camera, only to see the dang lawn pin aiming to try and climb up it again. Once more, I sprinted back to my second camera, picked the camera up and set it up right next to the main one. This was the most boring setup ever done in my career, but it would now have to do. The speech eventually ended and the first course was served. I was the only person slash service provider not catered for because, honestly, who cares about the videographer? To be fair, this didn't bother me because I wouldn't have been able to eat anyway, but I was still feeling horrible and really just wanted to rest for a while. I waited for the guests to start eating before spotting a sofa at the back of the venue and deciding it looked like a great place to rest. I had just sat down when I was approached by the jerk groom and the lawn pin. Groom. What are you doing now? Me, immediately back on my feet. There's really nothing I can shoot at the moment, so just waiting for the next speech. Was there something you needed? Yeah, please watch this stupid kid. And yes, he really did describe his new stepson as the stupid kid. Me. Huh? Yeah, just keep him quiet and make sure he doesn't disturb the guests. Me. What about when the next speech starts? Thank you the groom said, walking away without answering my question. I looked after him with bleeding eyes. This wasn't happening. The kid stared at me. I stared back at him. He continued staring at me and then started wailing his eyes out. I looked around frantically to see if any of the kid's relatives were going to come help, but nope. Giving in to my fate, I climbed down to the floor, opened the kid's backpack and started unpacking his toys. He stopped crying quite quickly as I let him show me his favorite toys. Skip forward about 15 to 20 minutes. The kid and I were in the middle of an intense dinosaur battle when I heard the next speech starting. I had asked the MC to give a two minute warning before each speech so that I could have time to set my cameras up again. I, unfortunately, had to move them away every time as to not block the traffic flow of the waiters. He forgot every single time. I missed the first few seconds of the second speech as I redid my setup, only to hear that the kid had started wailing again. I glanced in the direction of the couple, who were both staring at me with daggers in their eyes. I stared back at them with a look that said, 
what the heck do you want me to do about it? And left the kid to cry as I tried recording the second speech. The speech ended, well, I assume it did. The lawn pin was yelling so loud that I never heard it end, but I'm sitting here typing this story, so I think it's a fair bet. I moved my cameras away again and moved back towards the couch when I was bombarded by the couple. Bride. Why weren't you watching him? Me. Because I can't play babysitter and shoot your wedding video at the same time. Groom. Well, I told you to watch him. Me. And your wife paid me to capture your day on video. Again, I can't do both. Well, that was very embarrassing for us. A silence followed this, with me and the couple just staring at each other. Me. Are you waiting for me to say something? Just go do your job. The groom snapped before stomping off with his new wife. Which one? I yelled after them, once more getting ignored. The rest of the reception played off more or less the same until I was relieved of my babysitting duties by the bride's sister, aunt, mother, hairstylist. I have no idea who the heck she was, except that I now had to share my sofa. So the reception finally ended. I felt like I had just aged 10 years and it was now time for the family and couple photos. But what was this? Their praying had helped nothing and the wind was now blowing even worse than before. Now at this point, any logical bride would probably have been asking herself some questions. Specifically, what difference is it going to make if my hair gets messed up now as almost everything has already been done? And what is the point of even having my hair done if I'm not going to take any decent photos? This bride didn't ask those questions though, and therefore insisted that all her photos, couple, and family take place on the porch, on one single small spot on the porch. So the shoot went like this. I finally get them in frame, and the main photographer blocks me. I try a different angle, and the second photographer blocks me. Heck, I didn't blame the photographers. This was like trying to fit six people into a matchbox without taking out the matches. There was simply no space for all of us, and the couple had left this so late that the light was disappearing by the second. If this poor photographer had 20 minutes for all the photos, then I'll be surprised. The next thing to do was getting all the guests back upstairs for the opening of the dance floor. Both the photographer and I had about an hour left on the clock, so we were at least doing well for time. The photographer and I started back up the stairs to do our setup, but we were suddenly stopped by the MC. The MC informed us that the bride was tired, so she and the groom were going to retire to the honeymoon suite and would return in about an hour for the opening of the dance floor. The photographer and I looked at each other with a kind of, what? expression, but shrugged it off and went to wait upstairs. News of the couple's temporary departure quickly reached the guests and within less than 30 minutes, the entire reception hall had emptied with the exception of the waiters, bar staff, photographers, and myself. Another 30 minutes passed with no sign of the couple returning. Both the photographers and I were now off the clock. The photographers waited another 15 minutes, literally saying, forget this, and leaving. I wanted to do the same. My God, did I want to do the same. But the video I had taken so far was so bad. It was nightmare fuel bad, and I simply could not bring myself to leave without at least capturing the opening of the dance floor. And so I continued to wait for another 90 minutes. Finally, the couple returned, followed by around 10 or 15 guests. All of them now wore their casual attire and looked like they were ready for a night at a dodgy nightclub. And then I heard the words that finally made me lose my patience. MC, the couple isn't going to open the dance floor anymore. I stared at the couple with a livid expression on my face as the hip hop music started playing. The groom took to the bar and the bride started throwing grotesque dance moves with her friends. Seeing this, I picked up my gear and walked out of the room without saying goodbye to the couple. I did, predictably, get an email from the groom a few days later telling me to remove all the lawn pins crying from the video and that they expected the video to be a true representation of their special day. That I can say it definitely was. What would you have done if you were in this position? Would you have stuck around and kept trying? Or would you just have bolted and got out of there? Let me know in the comments. Next we've got, I helped get my wife's boss fired. 
So this is a story all about how my wife and I got her boss fired. For reference, my wife will be called Mary and her boss is Karen. I know, original, right? So, Mary started working for a college five years ago as an administrative assistant. She was given odd and end tasks, one of which was writing up the school handbook. She noted in the handbook that staff were required to take time for professional development. After some years and a few promotions, she lands a manager position in the department and spearheads an initiative to have all staff under her have approved time to attend professional development conferences. Karen always rejected this idea, but Mary decided one day to go to Karen's boss. We will call Bob. Bob is great. Once Mary has enough weight in the college, she went around Karen and got Bob to approve conferences for everyone in the department. For the next year or so, everyone got to choose any conference around the continental USA to attend on the company's dime. Everyone would come back with notes taken at every session attended, attached with a conference itinerary and given to their direct supervisor as proof of attendance. The employee would also present key points learned from their conference at a weekly departmental meeting. Pretty simple morale boosting opportunity, until someone had to abuse it. Karen had been bragging to other department directors as well as to Mary about swimming with dolphins during her recent travel to a conference. Mary didn't think much of it, as usually there was sometimes a free morning or afternoon to do with as you pleased at the conferences. My wife told me this during our nightly pillow talk, and having been raised in Orlando, where Karen decided to attend a conference, my head popped up and I asked, where? Mary replied with a well-known location run by a well-known company with a whale for a logo. I quickly replied that they close at 5.30. When did Karen have time for this? Mary, who had access to Karen's itinerary, dropped her jaw when she realized the conference Karen attended did not have free time during the business hours of the dolphin swimming experience. Mary went into an enraged clerical fury as she pulled up Karen's full travel itinerary for flight, hotel, conference, and other reimbursements. The school does most departmental work online, and therefore the school's server can be accessed remotely from secured or approved devices like Mary's phone. She also checked the website where Karen went swimming at to confirm hours of operation. According to the records submitted, there was no way Karen had time to swim with the dolphins during the experience's normal business hours without missing part of the conference. And according to Carrie's itinerary, she was supposed to have attended all sessions. Mary worked hard to have the privilege to travel the country to attend conferences, and Karen just messed it all up. Mary eventually wrote all of this up, attached the itinerary documents, attached photos of the encounter, and apparently from other theme parks that Karen had neglected to mention from social media, attached the hours of operation and sent this all to Bob. Mary texted me about an hour after she got to work the next day, saying Bob was livid. He was currently in the process of questioning everyone Karen had bragged to to see if the stories all matched up. A few days later, Karen was fired from the company for only attending one session of the three-day conference, lying about her report filed, using company funds for travel hotels and food to go play at theme parks, and for submitting a time card to get paid while doing all of that. Although Mary's name was anonymous through all of this, Karen seemed to blame Mary anyways. Karen sent mean and dark texts to Mary several times until the school could send a cease and desist. Worse of all, I guess Karen's husband was a deadbeat, so not only did Karen have to trade in her massive SUV for a smaller vehicle, she had also just signed on a new house only days before she was fired and now had no income to support the said home. I'm not completely cynical, people shouldn't be homeless, but Karen had also taken credit for a lot of Mary's work, made Mary do Karen's workload while Karen went away from her keyboard and many other instances of foul play I can't remember because there's so much pillow talk. Needless to say, Karen reaped what she sowed. Do you feel bad that Karen's losing her home or do you think she deserves it? Leave me a comment letting me know and drop a re while you're at it. Next we've got, I ruined this guy's entire holiday. I work at a call center for a large UK luxury caravan holiday park company. It's actually not a bad place to work and I have a lot of fun. 
Like most call center jobs, I deal with a lot of entitled customers. But there's one in particular that totally takes the cake. I spoke to this guy not long after getting the job, probably not even two months in. It's a long conversation, but I promise it's worth the read. He called up and he had turned up to the holiday park and checked into his accommodation, which was an extra wide and extra long three bedroomed model. I don't remember the exact name of the unit he was in, but it wasn't our bog standard caravan. It was a new model and pretty big. I went through my whole introduction and data protection, etc., and asked how I can help. I don't remember the exact conversation, but it went something like this. Entitled Parent I've just checked into my caravan, and it is absolutely tiny. It's a joke. Me I'm sorry to hear that, sir. Have you been to the reception to let them know you aren't happy? It's company policy that the call center aren't allowed to step on the park toes, so any complaints need to be dealt with by the park. But we get so many customers who call us up thinking they'll get a better compensation offer than what the park has given them. Entitled Parent Yes, they aren't going to do anything. They said there aren't any other caravans available, and the only option is to switch to a different park, which is ridiculous. Me Unfortunately, sir, if we have no other accommodations available on park, there's nothing we can do. I can see you are in an extra wide and extra long accommodation currently, so I doubt we would have anything bigger on the park anyway. Perhaps he cuts me off. We were in a much bigger accommodation last year, and we paid more money this year. I check his previous booking, and he was in a bog standard two bedroom unit the previous year. That means his current accommodation is 20% wider and 20% longer than the last year, just with an extra bedroom. Me. I understand you're disappointed, but I've just looked and you are actually in a larger accommodation this year than last year. Unfortunately, unless you would consider switching to a different park and paying the upgrade cost for a lodge, we don't have anything larger available. Entitled Parent. This is ridiculous. Let me speak to your manager now. Me. We don't have any managers available at the moment. Have you spoke with the manager on park? I tried. They wouldn't let me speak to the manager. Me. Knowing something isn't quite right about that. Okay. No worries, sir. Let me call the park and see if there's anything I can do. Are you okay to just wait on hold for a couple of minutes just while I try to clear this up? Whatever. I place the guy on hold and call through to the reception of the park he's staying at. Me. Hi, I've got a man on the phone here who's staying in this something caravan. He's not happy because he thinks it's too small, and I'm just wondering if I can transfer him through to a manager. Receptionist. He's already been down today and spoken with our general manager, but he isn't happy with what she said. He can speak with her again if he likes, but he'll need to come down here to speak with her. Me, confused. He just told me you guys refused to let him speak with the manager. I'm so confused. Receptionist. No, he's been down here three times now and spoken with her twice. He's also been standing outside of the reception making notes and staring at us for hours today. He wants money, but we've told him he isn't going to get it because there isn't anything actually wrong with his caravan. He just wants a bigger model, which we don't have. I apologize for wasting the receptionist's time and go back to the guy on hold. This is where it gets crazy. Me. Thanks so much for holding there, sir. So I've just spoken with the park, and unfortunately there is no manager currently on site higher up than the woman you've already spoken with. She's the general manager of the park. Well, she's an unhelpful idiot. She was incredibly rude, and she didn't want to help us at all. I want to speak to your manager now! Me. Unfortunately, as per our complaints policy, you do need to deal with this issue with the park. And as they've already explained, we won't issue any compensation to yourself as your issue is a personal opinion. There isn't anything wrong with your accommodation. Your entire company is a shambles. You've ruined my holiday. This caravan is a joke. It's a joke! Me. Sir, I will not tolerate you speaking to me like that. I'm trying to help you, and I will terminate the call if you continue to speak to me like that. He continued to scream at me the entire time, but I didn't hear the exact wording. You have ruined our holiday! We paid good money for this! 
He's honestly breaking his microphone at this point. He's screaming so loud, I can barely understand him. Sir, it is our company policy that you deal with this on park, and I will not tolerate you speaking to me this way. I will sue you! You love ruining people's holidays and taking people's money! <laughs> Goodbye, sir. I hung up on him at this point. No way in heck am I going to listen to that for eight fifty dollars an hour. I kept an eye on his client profile, though. Turns out, he did the same thing to the reception staff, and police had to be called later that night. Bear in mind, this guy was on holiday with his wife and baby. He is now banned from staying on any of our parks, didn't get to stay for his holiday, and got zero compensation. Entitled Dad Tries to Take My $3,000 Bike This just happened a few hours ago, and I'm still fuming after this happened. As the title says, someone tried to steal my bike. Important things to know, I live in the center of Milan, Italy. My school is about 45 minutes from where I live and I need to take the bus to go and come back from school with a welcome 20 minutes ride to my house from the stop. I'm an avid cyclist and because of that, my grandmother manages to scrape some money to give me this bike. I don't let anyone ride it because it's the last thing I have remembering her. On to the story. Cast, we've got me, we've got my best friend, We've got Entitled Dad and Entitled Kid. The day goes just like normal. I wake up, do my morning routine, and start cycling to the bus stop where I meet up with my closest friend, important, and get on the bus. As always, I attend school. Today was different. When I got to school, I saw one of the mothers that brings her kid to the bus stop. This is Entitled Kid. We never talked together since we never got along in the previous years, making us basically hate each other. This was strange, as his mother, not entitled, had a very important job in my father's company and always had to be at work on time to have a meeting with my dad. As school finishes, I get to the bus and sit with my friend. As usual, entitled kid gets on the bus and sits as far away as possible from us. As we get to the stop, I see entitled dad waiting for entitled kid. Strange, as he usually goes home alone on foot, but I really didn't think about it until I was walking towards my bike to unlock it. Entitled Dad and Entitled Kid approach me and my friend. The following conversation goes like this. This was all in Italian, so I have to translate some words from my city's dialect that are commonly used. Me and friend are talking about our passion of cycling and start to unlock our bikes. My lock is very old, and sometimes I have to put quite a lot of force to open it. Entitled Dad, high-pitched scream. What are you doing? Me, I turn around. What? Why are you trying to steal this bike? Me. It's my bike. Like heck it's not. Stop, or I'll call the police. Me. I lose my temper quite fast. What do you want? This is my bike, and friend can prove it. Friend. It's his bike. An entitled kid perfectly knows it's his. Entitled kid. No, it's not. It's my bike, you little jerk. I get up and show him the key to the lock. Entitled dad tries to snatch it but I step back and then push him back. Entitled Dad lets us scream as if I had hurt someone. Help! He assaulted me. He's trying to steal my son's bike. An important thing is that I'm obsessed with my weight and with my strength and often exercise at the gym to keep in shape. Because of that, I'm pumped as heck, what everyone says about me. This is my breaking point and I start to yell, both in Italian and my dialect, and shout blasphemies, very common in young people. Friend, who has had anger issues for his whole life, thankfully doesn't lunge at him like he'd do normally, but chases him. Entitled Dad gets back up and starts to high grunt heavily and decides it's a good idea to kick me in the abdomen. Since I already lost my temper, I socked him and he started crying like a little baby. Entitled Kid also tried to do something, but as he was trying to get me, my friend made him trip. I managed to open my lockout in my back and started to ride away with my friend. Thing is that Entitled Dad was one of the wealthiest men I knew, and he could have bought the bike for Entitled Kid with no problem, but instead tried to steal it from me. Unfortunately, since his mother works at my father's company, he was informed pretty straight away and called me, and I explained what happened on the phone and he sided with me. I called the mother and said sorry for how I reacted. She said that I overreacted, but I was in my right and said to tell her if it ever happened again. Have you ever had someone try to take something that belongs to you? Let me know in the comments. Next we've got 
Jerk manager destroyed my childhood game store, so I got him fired. I judge card games from local to world championships. For several games, I was head judge at the world championships. The town I grew up in had a game store. It was ran by a husband and wife, and eventually their kids joined in on the fun. It was a lot of fun. Every night, there would be no tables open, and for bigger tournaments, they would rent out vacant storefronts in the shopping center to fit everyone that would come. Eventually, they moved the store to a bigger store, and it would just keep growing. Some that grew up in the area and started playing at the store eventually had kids of their own, and they played in the store too. It became a tradition. This is the place that you took your kids to their first RPG game, or where you buy them their first booster packs. The only Friday nights that this store would be empty was if there was a big football game at the high school. The reason the store was so popular was because of the people. They were never flashy, and they treated everyone as if they were the best player in the world. They'd give away free snacks, sodas, booster packs for every little occasion, and sometimes just because. They were more than patient with players helping them build decks and helping people get better at the games. They also knew and were able to teach every game they sold in the store. I can walk in any day and there would be several RPG groups and rows after rows of people playing all sorts of games. Didn't matter if I bought anything or not, I can stay from open to close and not spend a dime and they would still treat me like I dropped a million dollars. It was Nerdvana. It was also the store where I judged my first event after I got my initial certification. And the husband had me as a judge for almost every event and he would compensate me half a box of booster packs for the smaller events, up to two boxes for bigger ones. For one really big release weekend, he gave me six boxes of booster packs and paid me. His wife was equally amazing and loved her nerds, as she affectionately calls us, more than he did. She would bake cakes for birthdays Every day for the week leading up to Christmas, there would be a tin of cookies always stocked and baked the night before. If people got in a jam and needed a last minute sitter, they could leave the kids at the store and she would warn the parents she'll watch them but she'll also teach them collectible card games. I think this is also why the store made so much money. There was a rumor the store actually belonged to her. Life happened and eventually I ended up living in a city about three hours away and a few years ago, I heard the wife had passed and the husband couldn't bear being in the store because everything reminded him of her, so someone else was running the store now. I planned on visiting the store, but being three hours away, I just couldn't make a casual trip there as a round trip would be six hours. Around the middle of last year, the store announced they were going to host a major qualifying tournament. This generated a lot of buzz. People from all over the region were making plans to travel to it. I thought this would be a great time to visit the store, so I made plans to go too. About two weeks before the event, I got an email from the publisher asking me to judge the event. I thought this was odd, as for store level events, the store fields the judges and the publisher doesn't get involved at all. Also, while there are a number of us judges, we're not so numerous that we don't know each other. So I knew there was enough judges in the store's area that should be able to handle the event. I wrote back saying, I was hoping to be able to play, but shouldn't there be judges in that area that would be able to do this? They wrote back with there should be, but the store owner said he couldn't get anyone, even with the list we sent him. Red flag. They ended the email with, you should talk to the other judges from the area and see if you can get more of the story. I wrote back with, give me a few days to think about it. I immediately started contacting the judges in the area. They all told me the same story. The store was sold to a guy and he was great. It was the manager that was the problem. He was a judge as well, but he thinks he knows better than everyone else. The manager would override obviously correct ruling because he was buddy with the person the judge ruled against. Apparently, this also happened at a major regional tournament. Now, one of the reasons I judge instead of play is judges are pretty well compensated, now anyways. Not just with booster boxes and our pay, but we also get some pretty sweet exclusive promos and swag. The jerk manager was hoarding judges' promos for himself. The judges found out about this after they went to a major event and another judge was talking about a sweet swag he got. The area judges put two and two together and realized what was going on. After this happened, judges that lived in the area all agreed that they wouldn't judge under him ever again. This wasn't the worst of it. He would harass players 
saying they can't bring any outside food or drinks. Tell them they have to buy products if they want to play in the store. He would harass the RPG players, telling them they have no life and they're just wasting valuable time. They could be playing better games. Needless to say, people tried to avoid him. But as the owner would sometimes run the store himself, no one can be sure when the manager from Heck would be around. I was livid. This was the store I grew up in. This was the store I learned to play and mastered all my favorite games. And this jerk was killing the store. I started to formulate a plan. I wrote to the publisher and told them I'll do it. Also, what was the judge's swag for this event? They wrote back, really grateful as they would have had to have pulled the event if I didn't agree to it, and told me everything I would get for judging. They even told me they'll throw something in special for me helping them out. I wrote back asking for a specific item I knew that the jerk manager would definitely want and I could use to trap him. The publisher wrote back saying yes, they would include that in the tournament kit as well. The day of the event, I woke up at the ungodly hour of 5 a.m., got ready and left the house at 7 a.m. and made the three-hour drive to my home store. I got there and there was already a line wrapping around the store. I said hi to people I knew from the store and those I met at larger events. It was like a mini homecoming. I walked in and the new owner, the manager, and two other judges were there and went over the day. The manager started saying that he's a level mid-tier judge and that he was the highest in the area right now, so he would be the head judge for the event, and what he says is final. I told him that I was a higher tier judge. On top of that, I had several advanced role qualifications. He said I was BSing him until I showed him my certification. He said he's still head judge because he was the manager of the store, and people in the store respect his authority. I had to stifle a laugh. Then I told him before I start, I would like my judge's swag. Now, normally, I get this at the end of the event because I don't want to carry it around all day. But given this guy's records, I wanted to give this guy as little chance as possible to steal what was owed to me. He started hemming and hawing and said he hasn't pulled the kit yet. I told him pull it, open it, and give me my swag or I will be walking away and I'd tell the publisher and this tournament will be invalidated. The owner tried to reason with me, but I was firm. I hated doing this to the owner. He hasn't done anything wrong. From what I heard, he was trying to continue the traditions and practices that the original owners had established. But I knew I needed to be a jerk to save the store's community from the manager. The manager finally came out and gave me my swag. I looked it over and I knew this wasn't everything that was promised to me. And I said as much. Then I pulled the email from the publisher that listed everything I was supposed to receive, including the special swag. The manager said he couldn't find it all and the owner begged me to wait until the end of the event so he could make it right. I stood firm and demanded my stuff. I listed everything, and this time I also listed the special item I requested from the publisher. The manager went pale. The owner looked at the manager and said, You said you got that when you judged that big event a few months ago. I pulled up the email where I requested the item and where the publisher said it would be included and showed it to the owner. The owner exploded. He demanded to see the entire packing list for the kit, and sure enough, my promised item was in there. Then I told the owner everything the other area judges told me, and the owner got redder and redder. Finally, I told the owner and the manager that unless I get the items I was promised by the publisher, I would call the police and report the theft, then walk out and make sure everyone outside knew what happened. The owner demanded the manager give me what was owed to me. He walked back and brought out everything that was listed in the email, plus the special item that was promised to me. The owner then fired the manager and apologized to me profusely for what had just happened and asked me to please judge. I agreed, started the tournament, and apparently it was the best ran tournament the store had since the change of ownership. No one walked away complaining, all the rulings were fair, and it even ended early. When I got home, I sent an email to the publisher with a tournament report as well as an explanation as to what happened. I also sent a long email apologizing to the owner for my crappy behavior. The owner wrote back saying he understood why I did it and he was actually grateful as I was able to help him see the truth. The fallout. The jerk manager was stripped of his judge certification. Also, the guys he tried to help cheat were given bans from the game. The owner hired one of the area judges to manage the store and it's slowly going back to what it was before the reign of the jerk manager. In the grand scheme of things, 
This wasn't some huge injustice that was righted, but this store is like family to me, and you don't mess with family. Are there any stores that you love as much as OP loved the game shop? Leave me a comment letting me know, and drop a re while you're at it. Next we've got, almost got the law called on me for a stolen receipt. This happened yesterday. I work for a retailer slash department store, and on Sunday we're usually not busy. It's also January, so we're really not busy aside from the droves of people coming in to return their Christmas gifts and make a fuss that they can't have cash back if they didn't pay with cash. The usual. I get to work in the shoe department today, so I head on over and am immediately met with an older lady, probably in her later 60s. She's there with her partner, who is another lady of similar age, and they both look like they shop in the men's department for their clothes and shoes. No big deal, so I get to assisting. Main lady, who we'll call Smallfoot for the sake of her visit, wanted to return some shoes she had bought because they were too big. No problem. I return the shoes, and since she had paid with our in-store credit card, I just let her know it will be put back on the card and she'll be refunded. It's only after we're done that she makes a fuss and says, Well, where's my cash? Turns out she didn't want the credit back because she wanted to get rid of our card. This isn't that huge of a deal, seeing as I can see exactly how much money went on her card, and then when she's finished shopping, we can charge that exact amount, so her balance on the card stays at zero. And then her partner, who we'll call partner, said she'll just pay the difference since it's Smallfoot's birthday and she was going to get her something else instead anyway. All right, well, I hand Smallfoot her receipt for the return, which I stapled to her old receipt, as we'll need that later to do what I just entailed. I spend the next 30 minutes or so bringing the shoes back and forth for Smallfoot to try on, and it's a difficult process since we don't carry very many of the small men's sizes in store. We usually have to order them for the customer. During this process, Smallfoot is urging me to get down and check her toe, saying how I'm the shoe salesman here and I need to show that I know my stuff. First of all, it's a department store, in which, yes, I am familiar with the brands and how to do most register things, but lady, I work here part-time from a seasonal gig I grabbed a couple years ago, only on the weekend, and the sort of people who are staffed in these areas are by no means a purebred shoe salesman shining a pair of legit leather shoes in their store window up in Atlanta or something. Second of all, I just found this weird since this is something a kid would have done by their parents, pinching on the toes of the shoe and telling them if it's too big or not, or a wife or husband smooshing up their spouse's shoe in a similar fashion. I wing it just to be a good sport, but like I said, I'm a cashier. And the most I can legitimately do if you have a shoe size question is to put your foot on a metal measure and show you where your big toe is so you can see what to get. Gripe over. Smooshing your toe in the shoe is not going to tell you anything. After we've picked out two pairs of shoes for small foot, I get to ringing them up. First, I have to look up their credit card number in our system since they apparently already tossed the card somewhere and had no plans on using it again. I then go the extra mile to run it and see if they had any rewards, which would give them another $10 off. Considering they probably just got it, they didn't have any rewards for me to apply. But that's okay. All I need now is the return receipt I mentioned earlier to make sure I charge them the right amount on the card. Well, Smallfoot decides that she doesn't have the receipt and that I still had it. I do a double take around my wrap stand, looking under the few shoe boxes we had lying around and glance into some drawers and even the trash can just to make sure I didn't swipe it off onto the floor or something. When I don't find it, I'm like, no ma'am, I don't have it. Could you have left it over there trying your shoes on perhaps? The fact that I dared even suggest that maybe she had misplaced her receipt somewhere, which couldn't have been far, really enraged this lady. She got this really gruff and aggressive sort of way of expressing herself and she comes around the register and tells me, let me dig through that trash because y'all are no good slimy liars stealing receipts. At this point, me and my ringing maid are just speechless. I let her peer around the counter while I dig through the nasty trash can and show her there are no receipts. Smallfoot then proceeds to accuse me and my ringing maid of stealing the receipts. There was a line forming behind this as it happened by the way, and by the time we resolved it later, they had all gone. However, while they were waiting, I could see their eyes get big as this lady just pitches a fit about how she's going to call the law on us for stealing her receipt and yada yada. Eventually, the voice of reason, partner urges her to check her pockets one more time. Guess where the receipt was? 
After handing it to me so I can do my thing, Smallfoot claims, I need to walk away. I've got to cool down. Like it was all my fault that she was up in a huff and ruining her blood pressure. I finish up the transaction just as planned with partner, and with a weak smile she claims, So sorry y'all, and heads off to find Smallfoot, who's stalking up and down the aisles now, throwing angry looks at my ringing maid. And that was only my first customer experience of the day. Remember kids, grand receipt theft is a real problem in retail. Karen screams, show me the policy. I work at a fairly popular beauty brand store. I love my work. I've been there for years and as of now have no thought of quitting. But there comes a time, and often it's on a daily, when we as retail workers come in contact with one of those customers. Our cast. We've got me. We've got crazy customer. Poor team member. Team member and poor husband. It was a Sunday. A fairly busy one to be exact. Now this is a little while ago and I can't be too exact about the promotions going on but I do remember there was an extra discount if you were a card holder. This comes into play later. I'm manager on duty for the night and making my rounds of the store, checking on customers and making sure my staff are doing okay. I notice we are running pretty low on a lot of stock, particularly our hair care section. We have some boxes in the back but we sell it so fast it probably won't last us the night. I stock its shelves and make it as full as I can for the time being. Satisfied with my work, I decide I better go take my break before it gets too late or we have an even bigger rush of customers. As I head to the back, I see teammate come out carrying out four boxes of the specific hair care we are nearly out of. I let her know I already stocked the shelf so there is no need to do so. Teammate, oh, no, it's not stock, it's for a customer. She wants to buy 24 boxes, but this is almost all we have. I'm going to get the last boxes in the back for her. Me. Leave the other boxes in the back. You know we can't sell that many to one person. And even if we could, we don't have the stock to hold us over. Let me go speak to her. Crazy customer stands at the cash with poor teammate speaking to her. Poor teammate is Chinese and speaks Mandarin, which crazy customer also does. We have a very diversified team, which is so amazing because there is usually a team member who can speak a different language if a customer isn't fluent. I go up to crazy customer with a smile and a soft voice. Me. Hi there. I heard you wanted to purchase our hair care. Crazy customer. Yes, that's right. I want 24 boxes. Me. I see. Unfortunately, we are not able to sell that many to a single person, especially with our promotion right now. Crazy customer. What do you mean you cannot? I'm a paying customer. Me. Oh, I understand. But due to the fact that many people resell products after buying items for a fraction of the cost, we are unable to sell that many. I'd be happy to sell you the four boxes teammate brought out though, as she already said she'd give you them. Well, what if my husband buys? Can he get more? I want them all. Me. Knowing we had a few more boxes in the back room. I'm sorry, this is all the stock we have and that I can give you at the moment. We will be expecting a delivery tomorrow. I can ask my stock girl to bring up extra boxes for you specifically. Why won't you just give me them all now? Your employee said there were more. Me. Ma'am, the policy is we are only supposed to give two boxes per customer when there is a sale. I'm giving you four, which already covers both you and your husband. I'm sorry, but many people love this hair care, and that's why we have a limit. She now starts to go off at poor teammate in Mandarin, which I was later told that crazy customer said I wasn't letting her buy because she was Asian. What? And that the rules were stupid, and the whole team was useless. We now have the biggest line and are down to one cash. Luckily, I have one of my fastest team members at cash, but that doesn't stop customers from glaring at crazy customer and becoming frustrated. Me. Ma'am, please don't yell at my staff. Uh, the policy is- What policy? Where is the policy? She yells at me, getting overly close that I nearly have to step back. Me, still trying to sound sweet. The policy comes from our head office during times when we have sales like these. Normally, I may be able to give you more if, one, it's regular price, 
And two, if I had the stock. Give me what I want! I want it all! Give it to me! And show me the policy! Me, beginning to get annoyed, turns my voice a little more stern. This is all I can give you. If you like, I can give you a few more off the shelf that are already unboxed, and tomorrow... I don't want to come tomorrow! I want it today! Tomorrow the cardholder deal will end! This is our policy. Show me the policy! Crazy customer smashes her fist down onto the counter. Show me the policy! Show me the policy! Show me the policy! Each time she says policy, she brings her palm down and slaps the counter. She goes back to shouting the same thing she did before at poor teammate who tries to calm her down with her soft, gentle voice. Customer is having none of it and calls her husband to come in. Her poor husband comes in looking tired and beat. His wife is going off at us and he doesn't even look shocked. Nor does he look annoyed with us. Instead, he kind of gives me a look to say, sorry. Me, ma'am, I'm going to ask you again. Please don't yell at my staff. You can yell at me, but there is no reason for you to yell at them. Also, if you want the hair care, then please buy it or refuse what I can give you and take none of it. The choice is yours. I'm finally over with this situation, just as everyone else in the store looks to be. The customer decides that yes, she's going to take the shampoo and take me up on my offer of taking a few more out of the box products. Not sure she understands the concept of a few more, as she scoops them all up off the shelves, leaving them bare and even goes as far as taking the few we had on our display. I'm taking these too. I nod knowing those display products have been sitting there for months and if she wants old products then so be it poor teammate helps me bag the hair care as i ring up her purchase although their purchase is way over the limit i have some satisfaction knowing i still had a few boxes in the back for the shelves and other customers that i would stock later when they left poor husband pulls out his credit card and pays for the purchase saying thank you to me i smile feeling bad for him and wish him a good night. Crazy customer is still huffing as she counts her hair care one by one as though I might have ripped her off. When she is finally done, she has her husband pick up the bags and she storms off. The husband somewhat fumbles while picking up the bags and I let him know that if he needed to make two trips, we would watch them for him. He kindly refuses and says thank you again before leaving. Poor teammate turns to me, shock on her face. Me, who is annoyed, starts to laugh and just shake my head. I ask for someone else to come on cash so she and I can step away. I tell her she did a great job, thank her for keeping her cool, and that she could go take a small break to calm her nerves. Teammate tells me she is sorry and wished she never told crazy customer we had extra boxes in the back. She wasn't thinking of the rules at that moment, just the sale. I tell her she's fine and ask if she could restock the hair care. Finally, it was time for my much needed break. About a year passed before I saw Crazy Customer again, and to be honest, I'm surprised she even came back. Twice so far to be exact. The first was to pick up some lotion that she had multiple coupons for. I let the staff know that even though they weren't to use more than one per day, to just do it so we could avoid a fight. The second was of course right at close and we had to wait extra for Crazy Customer to leave but she didn't give us any more trouble. This story became a good chuckle amongst the team working that night. If you were a cashier, would you ever bend the rules just to avoid a fight with Karen? Let me know in the comments below. Next we've got the day I gave my four weeks notice. I came to the store on a Wednesday morning to hand in my four weeks notice, but when I got there, my colleague was working the checkouts and the customer service by herself. The manager was handling the safe, so she couldn't come and help and we had to wait for another colleague to finish the unloading of the truck. So, me being a great colleague, I helped the only customer at the customer service to make sure she didn't have to wait for at least 10 minutes to get a pack of cigarettes. And just when I closed the customer service, Karen came around the corner. The customer service does have a little checkout for people with baskets, which Karen had. However, it was closed. And since I was off the clock and I had an appointment later that morning, I was not going to open that checkout for her. Mind you, I had been chatting with the other customer for a while and around 8 to 10 minutes had gone by at that point. And since I was in my raincoat, which is not even close to the work attire, 
I thought she would understand the circumstances given the huge line at the other checkout. Okay, on to the actual conversation. We've got me, we've got Karen, we've got nice lady and the manager. Karen puts the clothes sign in the magazine rack, opens up the exit and puts her stuff on the counter, AKA opens up the checkout herself. Me, oh, I'm sorry miss. The register is closed since I'm off the clock. My colleague asked me to help this lady real quick since no one else could at the time, but there should be someone here in two minutes max to help you out. Karen, how dare you? I am a loyal customer and you cannot treat me like this. I am a widow and have to do everything by myself. You are going to help me right now and I will not take no for an answer. I have always worked for my boss without getting paid. Manager, miss, if I may ask, what is the problem here? She won't help me. Nice lady. This nice girl just helped me get some cigarettes since your colleague asked her to help me out so I didn't have to wait for 15 minutes. Me. That's right. The checkout was closed since I'm off the clock and only here to give you my four weeks notice. She knew about this. Was not a surprise. Manager. Well, miss. So sorry she couldn't help you but I'm here now so I can help you. Karen. You need to get your workers under control. That little jerk shouldn't have treated me like this. I am a loyal customer. Nice lady. Miss, she is off the clock, and the manager is checking you out right now. Can't you be a bit nicer to this young lady? Karen. Do not mess with me, you dumb jerk. And do not get involved. I'll make your life miserable. Manager. Miss, please stop insulting my coworker and the lady right here. They did nothing wrong. If you say one more bad thing, I will not help you any further and you can leave without your groceries. The customer left without saying anything else and the manager, nice lady and I had a great laugh afterwards. Another fun fact, this woman has been a Karen for at least 15 years. My parents have a hedge in their back garden which was always maintained by my granddad. Apparently, Karen lives in the same neighborhood and stopped by to ask my mom about the electric hedge trimmer and if my mom could trim her hedge. When my mom told her it was being maintained by her father-in-law, she called her a lying jerk and also told the story of her deceased husband and how she can't do it herself. And I ran into her last week. She gave me the dirtiest look I've ever gotten. It was hilarious. Would you ever do yard work for a Karen? Let me know in the comments. Next we've got, Karen is angry that we did what she asked us to. So, this took place in the summer of 2016 when I worked on NCS. This is a youth program where 16 year olds live away from home for two weeks, learn how to live independently, and then partake in a social action project for another two weeks. For this, the young people are split into teams, and usually the teams will not change unless there is a serious issue. This is important later. Cast, we've got me. We've got James, who is Karen's son, and we've got Karen, the entitled mom. I was a team leader. My team was 15 people and they were all lovely. However, the day before we were set to leave for the first week, I get a call from Karen. Hi, this is Karen. My son James was meant to leave on July 15th, but I was wondering if he could be moved to July 9th because he doesn't get along with the people on his team. The 9th is the wave I'm going on so the decision has to go to my wave lead. Me. Hi, this is Red. I'm afraid I can't make the decision, but I can pass it on to my wave lead and see what he says. I can ask him to call you back. That would be amazing. Thank you. I pass on the information to my wave lead and forget about it because I have a load of paperwork to do. Two hours later, I get given James paperwork. James has been moved to the 9th of July wave and he's been placed on my team. He moved waves because he had fallen out with his friends on his old team and was specifically placed in my team because Karen didn't want him on a team with people from his school. My team was the only one that didn't have anyone from his school, so it seemed like the logical choice. I go through the paperwork and make all the finalizations, moving him to a room in the activity center that didn't have anyone from his school because it seemed like the right thing to do at the time. Fast forward to midnight on the 10th of July. I'm on the night shift. Get another call from Karen. Hi Red, this is Karen. I have a complaint. Me. Hello Karen, I'd be happy to take your complaint. Good. James is unhappy with his team 
because he doesn't know anybody on his team. They all go to different schools. They all have at least one friend, and he has nobody. And he's sharing a room with complete strangers. I sense that I can't win this battle, but luckily when things like this happen, it can be sorted out relatively quickly. Me. Yes, he was put on my team because you asked that he was placed on a team with nobody from his school. And my team was the only one without a person from his school. I moved him to a different room so he'd be with people on his team. And that is our policy. Well, I want him moved to a team where he knows at least somebody. I didn't ask for him to be alone like this. And I want him to have his own room. Me. He can't move teams when the program has commenced, as we have no way to change the paperwork, and he can't have his own room, as there are no free rooms in the center we are at. Well, I want to speak to your boss. He was moved once before. You can do it again, surely. Me. No, we can't. Moves are only done in cases of special circumstances, such as illness or family emergency. You asking for him to be moved, and then complaining that we did it, does not constitute. I can pass you on to the wave lead, but he will tell you the exact same thing. Karen just hung up on me, so I passed on the call to the wave lead, who was upset about the whole ordeal. Late on the 11th, Karen shows up having driven halfway across the country without even calling first. I'm here to take James home. He isn't happy with his team, and you people haven't been very helpful. I also want my 50 pounds for his place back. Me. Sorry. You need to clear this with the wave lead and the head of the program, not me. And the places are non-refundable. Karen turns bright red. What? So even though you have been unhelpful, you won't let me take him home where he'll be happy? And why can't I get a refund? Me. Due to policy, I can't just let him go. I've texted the wave lead. He's coming right now. And the place normally costs 1,500 pounds but due to government subsidies, only cost you 50 pounds. Due to this, places are non-refundable. There is nothing I can do about it. Fine. The wave lead comes and begins a shouting match with Karen after she starts threatening to call the police. Finally, we agree to let James go because we can't be bothered to argue. I pull out the paperwork I need to fill out. 10 sheets, it takes forever to do, and I am exhausted. I start to slowly slog through it all. Karen. What are you doing? Let me take James now. Me. I have to do all this paperwork, pass it to the wave lead, then pass it to the head of the program for them all to fill their bits out and sign off before we can let you take James. I also need to see some ID. She throws her driver's license at me. Can you hurry it up? It took me five hours to drive here. I want to take James and go home. Me. If you'd called ahead and told us you were taking him, the paperwork would have been done by the time you got here. I have to fill it out right, or it'll look like I lost him. I'm sorry that us accommodating your wishes for James to move have caused these issues for you, but I'm running on two hours sleep, and I'm due to clock off in an hour, so this inconveniences me as much as it does you. This is ridiculous. I'm calling the police. Me. Do it. She calls the police while I sit there doing the paperwork, and they arrive just as I'm finishing the last piece passing it on to my wave lead. I tell them the same thing I told Karen, and they understood completely, and stay to keep her calm while we finish the paperwork. Two hours after I was meant to clock off, James and Karen leave, and I treat myself to a nice cold can of Coke. Next we've got, Karen calls us brats for not giving her and her kid our seats. Cast, we've got entitled mom, we've got innocent kid, we've got entitled mom's hubby, entitled mom's daughter, my friend and me. A little backstory. Both my friend and I have a membership at our local cinema. Apart from getting discounted tickets and candy stuff like popcorn, drinks, etc., we also get two courtesy monthly tickets to watch whatever we want. Whenever you buy a ticket, you also book a specific seat. This will be important later. This time, my friend offered to use her free tickets, went online and got the tickets. She made sure we got good seats well over two days in advance. Anyway, the day comes and we get to the cinema. We buy popcorn and the drinks, headed to the screen room. The room was packed, and I really mean packed. There were a few seats left, but since we had booked tickets in advance, we weren't worried. We should have been. When we got to our seats, much to our surprise, 
we find entitled mom and innocent kid were set in our seats. I should also mention, there were two more empty seats next to ours. This will be important later. Had the room not been so full, we would have probably sat elsewhere. But since there were very few seats left, and those would most likely be booked already anyway, we politely asked the mother to move. The conversation went like this. Me. Ma'am, these are our seats. Uh, could you give them back, please? Entitled mom, looking thoroughly displeased. Oh, can't you just sit elsewhere? These are the only four seats that are together, and we want to be sat with my husband and daughter. They had gone to get popcorn. Me. No, ma'am. We won't take random seats because the cinema is packed and seats are pre-booked. However, we could switch with you if you want. Entitled mom pulling a face. There's people in my seats already. That's why I took these. Me. Well, that's not my problem, ma'am. If my friend and I sit elsewhere and the owners of those seats come, we'll have to give them up and then we'll be left without seats. Entitled mom rolls her eyes at us, grudgingly picked her stuff up, and she and her son moved to two of the three empty seats on the row behind us while we took our seats. So far, so good. Anyway, my friend and I got settled and got talking while we waited for the ads and the movie to start. We heard nothing from entitled mom and her kid, until hubby and daughter appeared. The husband asked if she hadn't managed to get them seats together, which essentially made us doubt her story about their original seats being taken by other people. An entitled mom went ballistic. She said that, yes, she found four spaces, but had to leave because of us. Two entitled and selfish brats that wouldn't allow her to take the empty seats so they could sit together as a family. I tried to cut in and explain that we didn't want to move because essentially there weren't any free, good spaces left. Nor were we sure if those seats were already booked, but the woman told me to shut up and eat my popcorn several times. She insisted that it cost us nothing to switch seats with them. Just as she was saying this, the owners of the seats behind us arrived, a couple. When they asked for their seats, Entitled Mom started berating us and calling us basically jerks for not wanting to give them our seats so she could sit with her family for an hour and a half long movie. By this stage, I'm ready to get into a fight with this wild Karen, but my friend told me not to bother. The poor couple saw that they'd be getting into problems if they dared ask for their seats, so they preferred to go and search for empty seats elsewhere. Since the row behind us only had three empty seats, Entitled Mom proceeded to sit on the aisle for the whole movie and made snide comments about us until the movie started. Thankfully, my friend was there. Otherwise, I would have most likely gotten into another argument with Entitled Mom. When the movie ended, we quickly got our things and left. Would you have given Karen your seat so she can sit with her family? Or would you have done what OP did? Let me know in the comments below. Entitled Anne thinks that because we are family, I'm her personal servant. Backstory. I was 15 and I got my first job. I worked at a commissary as a bagger. For those who don't know what a commissary is, it's a grocery store slash restaurant on a military base. Remember that part. I was super excited for my first job. I could finally make my own money and not ask my parents all the time. Until it happened. The moment my entitled aunt realized I worked in a grocery store, she made me do everything bag slash pack up her groceries, find her foods whenever we are there while she sits on her phone. I was her little maid, her slave as she told me. Not once did she do anything, nor let her son, he's not entitled, do anything while I'm around. Here's the story. Our cast, we've got me, we've got entitled aunt, nice cousin, amazing manager, cool coworker, and my mother. The moment I turned 15, I went to browse jobs because I always wanted to make my own money. I looked young, I'm part Asian, and my family, when we get older, don't age slash age incredibly slow. So we have baby faces in my case. I looked like I was fresh out of middle school. So many people didn't believe that I was 15. I asked all over the place. The Burger King that was hiring, Chipotle, Target, Walmart, etc, etc. But every time, I was met with a stern no from the employees and managers of the place. I was getting really upset. I know there were places that were hiring at 15. I looked it up. Until while walking in the commissary with mom, she met up with an old guy, who we'll call Mr. B. Mr. B and my mom were talking straight away 
while I was too busy looking at the cheese aisle because I love cheese. I heard a quite deep voice call my name, so I turned around and I was met with Mr. B smiling at me. He asked me if I was looking for a job and I nodded, not quite sure where this was going. He said that they could always need some more baggers. For those who don't know what a bagger is, it's where people bag your food, put it into your shopping cart, and take you out to their car to put it away. My mom thought that was a fantastic idea, whereas I was a bit hesitant. Grandma and Mr. B were close. They would always talk whenever she came over, but I didn't really know him too well. But my mom got the paper from him, told me to fill it out when we got home, and that's exactly what I did. Now the fun begins. I worked there Wednesdays, Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. There were a bunch of people constantly, so many customers. It was quite fun working in a fast-paced workplace. I was a couple months in already, so I got to the point where I was one of the best baggers there. Quick, polite, fast, and I always stayed in my lane. There were 19 lanes. Number one lane was the fast lane. Only one bagger was stationed there, but you get a total of over $200 staying from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. As a bagger, you worked in groups of three. I worked with older teenagers, but we were all cool. We worked on rotation, so whenever we get tipped, we won't be confused on who gets the money. Baggers work only for tips, but most of the days, we make well over $100 on tips. If the days were bad or slow, we would make only about $50 or so. I've met my fair share of quite mean people, but I didn't care at all. I knew the commissary like the back of my own hand. I knew where everything was, and I was always quick to get it. Lots of people relied on me, and I liked it. I was working my shift with two people, who I'll call Mikey and Melody. Mikey was always the jokester, trying to distract me from my work, but he was as efficient as me when it comes to people and bagging. The times where customers came in with cards filled to the brim with food, we were excited yet dreading it, because usually we would get such a good tip from it, sometimes $20, but other times a sweet $100 tip. A young woman was behind this elderly grandma. We'll call her Sweet Grandma. Sweet Grandma was very polite, laughing and smiling at me because it was my turn and I was very polite towards her. We joked a lot. We asked them, paper or plastic? And whenever we got the answer as paper, we would be seething because it would take too long to open it and double pack it and just, it was crazy. And sometimes people would bring in their own bags for us to put it in, like what Sweet Grandma did. The young woman behind Sweet Grandma was groaning and sighing, tapping her foot and glaring at Sweet Grandma, as if Sweet Grandma spoiled her favorite cookies. We would help them to their car as stated, pushing the cart and either slowing down for the customer if they were old or catching up with them if they were more mobile. The moment I grabbed Sweet Grandma's cart, which was kind of packed, the young woman widened her eyes and the conversation followed. Young woman, oh my god, hurry up, me putting on my polite face. Ma'am, she is elderly. Don't worry, Melody will be serving you soon. Young woman glaring at Melody. She looks new. I don't want a slow new person doing the job. I want you. Me, looking at the grandma. I'm busy as you can see. I gesture at sweet grandma who was politely waiting for me. Melody, a bit irritated she has to deal with this lady. Paper or plastic? Young woman, still glaring. No! I want Mikey cuts her off with a sharp ahem. <clears throat> Me, already wheeling sweet grandma and her cart of groceries away. Good luck, Melody and Mikey. In the end, I got an amazing tip and a butterscotch candy from the grandma while Melody and Mikey were stuck with her. Not sorry. I was doing a normal shift. I was on lane 18, which is one of the best lanes to be on. The lanes 16 and up were always the best spots for baggers since more people came through rather than the other numbers, which were further down the line. I was working with Melody and a new guy, but he learned fast, and he was quite nice and cool. I was helping Melody. The baggers that don't have a person help the one that has a customer. When we heard a small crash, me, Melody, new guy, and a couple other baggers saw that someone pushed in the line and caused the lady to drop a few cans. I sent new guy to quickly help her before helping us with this customer. Once Melody went out, it was just me and new guy. The person that pushed the lady in line was my aunt, entitled aunt. Me and her locked eyes, and her face lit up. 
Oh no. If you know someone, the customer could ask either the other baggers or the cashier or both if they can switch spots. It happens all the time. Entitled Ant asked the cashier, and he asked New Guy. He didn't mind, and stepped back for me. Entitled Ant smiled at me even brighter, and I sighed. Her son, nice cousin, was there with her, so it wasn't too bad. Me, putting on my polite face. Hello, ma'am. Paper or plastic? Entitled Ant stares at me in confusion. Me? You know what I want. Just hurry it up. She was rummaging in her large purse, for I guess her wallet, phone, I don't know. I stood there, confused. Some days Entitled Aunt wants plastic, other days she wants paper or double paper. Nice cousin came up behind me and quietly said, she wants plastic today. I thanked him and started packing. Bagging was simple, meats with meats, cans with cans, eggs in a paper bag and plastic for cover, bread in a paper bag, etc, etc. While me and new guy worked quickly, I went to grab the pack of ribs when I felt a sharp sting. Entitled Ant slapped my hand and gave me a hard glare. The cashier told her to not hit the baggers while working, but of course, Entitled Ant ignored her. She then grabbed the meat and examined it closely and dropped it on the conveyor belt in disgust. Here it comes. Entitled Ant in disgust. The meat is black, aka spoiled. It was clearly visible. Why she didn't change it when she first got it, I have no idea. The cashier apologized and asked me to get a new one. I nodded, told new guy to keep it up, and darted away. I ran through the candy aisle into the meats, grabbed the pack of ribs, bagged it, and ran back. Entitled Ant smirked. Entitled Ant, back to a sweet voice. Say, can you get some chocolate and put it into my bag? I would like some chocolate pretzels, the big bag of M&Ms, gushes. She listed every candy imaginable, and then some. As a bagger and a worker, I nodded grabbed a handheld bag, and gathered it all. Once I came back, I was catching my breath. Melody came back and boasting at how she got $15. Before I gave it to the cashier, Entitled Aunt snatched it and looked to see if all the candy was in there. It was, but she scoffed. Entitled Aunt glaring at me. Where are the gushers? Go put this all back right this instant. I was too tired from running around the store. Not that athletic. Me, out of breath. Ma'am, you are holding up the line. Entitled Aunt shrugs. So? It's just me and you. And you are a worker, and I am a customer. And besides, I'm your aunt. Meaning you should... Her son cuts her off. Nice cousin, starting to get embarrassed. Mom, I'll get the gushers and put everything back. Entitled Aunt, huffing loudly and annoyingly. No, nice cousin. OP is the bagger. She can handle it. Now... Get my gushers. I sent new guy, so me and Melody worked together. The line was getting longer and people were getting impatient, but Entitled Aunt was getting impatient with me. Now everything I do, she critics. Entitled Aunt. No, I want eggs with the bread. No, that's wrong. Don't just throw my tomatoes in. Use this kid. The cashier and I looked at each other. I didn't mind the way her face said, is this lady serious? This wasn't even her full fury. Finally, we packed everything. Nice cousin grabbed the cart, but his mother grabbed his arm and yanked him. Entitled Aunt, glaring at Nice Cousin. No, OP is a bagger. Now come along. I didn't argue. I grabbed the cart and went out. The air was cold and it felt nice, but the heat radiating off of Entitled Aunt was getting hotter by the second. Then it happened. Entitled Aunt. Now, since you got my cart, Come home with us. I looked at her as if she was stupid. She's kidding, right? Me, dumbfounded. Entitled Aunt, I can't do that. I still have over five hours of work. There are others in need. I can't just leave. Entitled Aunt, rolling her eyes. Yeah, sure. Oh, we are here. Put everything in the back. I did. The trunk of her car was filthy. It made me so sick. As a bagger, I've seen many types of trunks but Entitled Ant's was the worst. I was placing it all in as Entitled Ant hovered over my shoulder. Nice Cousin was on standby. The moment I grabbed the eggs, when I placed them down, I felt a stinging pain on my hand. Entitled Ant slapped me. Me, confused and shocked. Um, ow? What the heck was that for? Entitled Ant starting to growl at me. One, don't yell at your family. And two, what did I say? 
No eggs on the trunk floor. You could break them. Me. Ma'am, you never... She cut me off. Entitled Aunt, huffing angrily. There goes your tip. Nice cousin, take the eggs and the bread before she ruins it. Terrible baggers, I swear. I sighed, clenching my teeth. I finished quickly, wanting her to stop staring at me as I worked. The moment I closed the trunk and grabbed her cart, I wasn't expecting a tip from her anyways, when I felt a pain on the back of my head. She got me yet again on the back of my head. This time, I was at my tipping point. I had a short fuse, and I don't tolerate with bullies, whether you are my boss, friend, or coworker. Me, infuriated and starting to turn red. Don't do that again, you jerk. I'm doing my job. Entitled Ann, getting equally as mad. I told you to get in my car. You are my niece and a slave. All you do is bag food and get money. Baggers are useless when they can't even do their job. When we get home, your mother... I stopped her, standing my ground against her. But she was just getting louder and louder. Me, trying not to blow up. Ma'am, I am a bagger of the fort... Name of base. Commissary. I came here to do my job and that's all. I will not tolerate this. I gave you a warning once, but now you've pushed it too far. She tried to cut in, but I sharply snarled at her, feeling my blood boiled. Entitled Aunt was like this with everyone, and I had had enough of it. I'm getting my manager and the police for what you've done. Now have a good day. I went back, fuming in red. Awesome manager and new guy were actually waiting for me outside. I went up to them, trying to put on my best smiling face. New guy, very understanding. It's okay. Don't put on a fake smile. I came out here with awesome manager because you were taking too long getting back. The camera on the outside of the building caught everything. The argument, what she did to you, he trailed off, looking at our awesome manager. He's very understanding. And since he was like my grandma's and mom's good friend, he looked at me with a kind expression but was talking kind of stern. Awesome manager. I heard everything. You shouldn't have yelled at them, but it was all caught on camera. I called the police because I later found out from other baggers she's been hitting them for a while now. Mostly to our newer workers. I'm sorry about that. Me, nee, pleasantly surprised. Oh, no worries. Thank you, awesome manager. Manager patting my shoulder. You are a great worker, and you stood up for yourself. I'll tell your mom the truth if Entitled Aunt decides to spread lies about you. Me, nee. thanks. I took new guy and playfully pushed him. We should get back to our job. We shouldn't have kept Melody for so long. Awesome manager. No worries. Two other co-workers are in for you and new guy. OP, go on a lunch break. And new guy, tell Melody she can go on her lunch break. And we all went inside. In the end, it was a good day. I made well over $100 in tips. The tax we had was every hour we worked, a dollar was taken, but I still made a lot. I got picked up from my job by my father, who I told him what happened. He was proud of me for standing up to Entitled Aunt and telling her off because someone needed to. He got me a crunch bar and a huge orange Gatorade. My favorite. I'm sorry for this story being so long. To this day, I still respect baggers because it was my first ever job and where I got my own money. So every time someone bagged my groceries, I would tip them a bit extra. Once I quit the job, some cashiers still recognized me and were very happy. My awesome manager was still there, and so was new guy and Melody. It was a good time. I made a bunch of other memories, both good and bad. Sorry for the typos. Thank you for reading my story. Have you ever had an entitled family member? Let me know in the comments below. Next we've got Tutor targeted students, so we took him down. A little background. I originally went to college intending doing maths and physics, but due to multiple factors didn't get the grades. So I jumped into IT instead as the course didn't need grades as high and there was a need for IT techs in the market. The class I ended up in had about 5 of us that honestly didn't need to be there. We were your ultra comp nerds and pretty much could answer every question from day one. Some tutors saw this and used us to help the other students who came to the class not knowing jack about computers. Then there was malicious tutor. Our class was rather rowdy. A lot of male teens that most of them were there cause, well, they didn't know what they wanted to do in life, and this gave them some grades for university or something. Most of them continued on to other college courses, then went to uni after, so on to the actual story. Me and my small group of friends often sat at the front of the class, often chatted while we worked, and generally liked to have a joke or two. But we did our work. 
Things started out with malicious tutor telling us in the middle of class that we needed to stop talking and get on with our work. Okay, we were mostly joking then, so sure. Maybe we were distracting him. But as time went on, he would start to snap at us for talking about our work, moving to help each other with stuff we had already done or just knew more about, etc. The time that took the biscuit was about halfway through the first year when on a day we were doing our assignments which were due the next day, something most of our tutors let us do in class if we had all our other work done. And the two of the group that knew the least needed some help finishing off their stuff. Most of us were working on other classwork. The main lecture had been done and the other people in the class were not passing that assignment first time as none of them were working on it, even though the tutor had said, use this time to get it in. I don't want late assignments. They were instead laughing, joking, generally messing around and playing games at the other side of the room where he couldn't see their computer screens. Malicious tutor turns to us and rather angrily and only to our small group demands that we shut up, sit at our own desks and stop distracting him. We had been distracting him every lesson and were problem students. He wouldn't listen to any of us about helping each other or anything else, wouldn't give the two that needed the help the help and being nerdy anxious teens none of us wanted to risk a fail or anything for all the work if we just walked out so we complied after the class we got to talking one of the people in our group who we referred to as griff in college had done another course before this one and had many more tales of malicious tutors from losing assignments to straight up refusing to help students with one occasion breaking some code in a software assignment and then just shrugging and saying don't know, sorry, and leaving the student to fix it. It was here I decided to hatch a plan, a plan that snowballed far quicker than I expected. That night I jumped on Skype, hit up Griff, and started writing down everything that had been happening. The seemingly innocuous harassment, the lack of assistance, the losing of assignments over the years, the specific targeting and ignorance of other people doing exactly what he was complaining about. Everything we could get our hands on, I then spent the next few days going around with a handcrafted letter to everyone that I knew had been affected, which although everyone thought it might get him spoken to, but nothing more, still signed it to say that they agree with what was written and that they can corroborate it. I then sent the letter straight up the ladder, not to his supervisor or manager or boss, but his boss's boss. This bit wasn't intentional, but it made it snowball. And although I had planned out a whole bunch of stuff to give evidence of his actions, I didn't need any of it. Within a few hours of depositing the letter, I was pulled from my class by the head of the department who was assuring me that I wasn't in trouble and all the usual stuff. I was taken straight to her boss's boss who said something along the lines of, OP, because of how you've approached this complaint, we have got to take it very seriously. Did all the people who signed this read it? Yes, tutors, managers, boss's boss. They did, and I believe other people have made complaints in the past too. Okay, OP, if you want, we can omit any names and this can be dealt with as an anonymous complaint, but that is up to you. I'm fine with my name being used, but I can't say for anyone else who signed the letter. Thank you, OP. If we need anything else from you, we'll be in touch. I can't say for certain, but I'm sure he then called in every other person on the letter and all of them asked to stay anonymous. By the next week, the tutor had disappeared and no one knew why or where he had gone. Even his colleagues didn't know exactly what had happened, only that he had left. We didn't see him again that year. The head of the department was also changed. I'm assuming because she hadn't dealt with the complaints properly, but she just got a demotion. She was a good tutor. The next year, I was stood near the room my next lecture was and malicious tutor walks down the corridor, making a point to stop in front of me, shake my hand, ask how my studies are going, and tell me if I ever need anything, I can come straight to him. Kinda creepy, and he never did it to any other students. I was never put in any of his classes again, even though he did lectures on my subjects. I found out before I finished my last year, he had been put on leave, then made to attend a training program and hit with a good old last chances warning. Probably with, attend this program or you're fired. Moral of the story, the pen is mightier than the MT's bark. Karen is reporting me to the medical board. I'm an architect. I work in an architecture firm in a large building that also contains many other types of professional offices. 
The receptionist for my firm is on another floor. My office is on an upper floor, in a corner, so it's not a logical place for people to go first when they come to our building and don't know where they're going. Nevertheless, it has a door directly to a main corridor, so lost people occasionally knock on it, which is why we have a sign on it with the name of our firm and directing people to our receptionist on the third floor. Alas, the sign did not deter this middle-aged, impatient lost lady and her husband from knocking on my door. Lady, is this the doctor's office? Me, no, this is an architecture firm. Lady, how do I get to the doctor's office? There are building directories in the stairs and at the elevator. I start to give her directions to stairs and elevator, but she interrupts. Lady, getting huffy and impatient, and pushing her way past me right into the middle of my office. Why can't you just tell me where the doctor's office is? Me. I'm sorry, but there are a lot of offices in this building, including at least 10 doctor's offices, and I don't know their floors or office numbers. Can't you call and find out? I'd be happy to let you use my phone. Why can't you call? Me. Sensing I'm not going to get rid of her unless I call somebody. What's the doctor's name? Do you have the number? I don't remember his name. I have a 2.15 appointment. I'm going to be late. Note that this is not an elderly woman, and I just wasn't getting the sense that this was a confused old person with a memory issue. But still, I'm trying to be nice and helpful, even if just to get her out of my office. Me. I'm sorry, but without a name or number, I don't think I can call the doctor's office for you. Maybe I can Google this address and see what doctor's offices show up and that will jog your memory. Lady, I don't have time for this. Call the building manager. I explained to the woman that I don't have the contact info for building management, and there's no staffed main office in this building. We're back to there's nothing I can do except suggest that she walk down the hall and check the building directory at the stairs. Her husband is trying to drag her in that direction, but she's not having it. Lady, you are the worst receptionist. Businesses don't know how to get good people these days. I'm going to tell the doctor about you. Me. I'm sorry, but I'm not the receptionist, and I don't work for your doctor. I'm an architect. You're in my office. In case that isn't obvious from the fact that the door opens directly into my small, messy office filled with drawings. Our firm's receptionist is on the third floor, as the sign on my door says. Lady. Well, why didn't you say so? I will go wait down there. Me. Wait for what? We're an architecture firm. Our receptionist works for the architecture firm. We have nothing to do with the doctor's offices or any other companies in the building. You call her and tell her I'm on my way down there. At this point, her husband seems to be grasping that I and my office and my firm have nothing to do with her doctor, whose name escapes her, and starts trying to explain it to her. She brushes him off and yells at me again to call my receptionist. I dial our receptionist with the lady still standing there and say that a couple is on their way down, but that they are looking for a doctor's office in the building and I hope that they will read the building directory in the stairs on their way down. Lady. Well, I never. I have never before actually heard that phrase used in real life. I thought it was reserved for caricatures of uptight entitled old women on TV like Nellie Olson's mother. She flounced off down the hall, that's like stomping but floatier because she was suspended by hot air, dragging her husband. I thought that since they had to use the stairs or elevator to get to our reception area, they would see the directory on their way down and it would jog their memory as to which doctor they were looking for and it would tell them where to find that doctor. But no, she did find her way down to pester our receptionist and told her that I was a horrible employee and that she was reporting me to the state medical board. Edit. To clarify that there's no building security, there are three ways into the building and no lobby, no front desk, and no main office. That's why there are directories in the stair slash elevator cores on every floor. I do feel bad about foisting her off on our receptionist, but that wasn't really deliberate. I was just trying to explain that my office wasn't reception and that it even said so on my door. I thought that once they got to the stairs, they'd read the directory and go wherever they belonged, but that didn't work. My receptionist knows the rest of the building tenants better than I thought and was able to send her somewhere. 
I don't know if where she got sent to was correct, but she didn't find her way back to us. Would you have tried to help Karen find her doctor's office, or would you have just told her to get lost? Leave me a comment letting me know. Next we've got Entitled Mom Wants a Newer Model. This just happened a few hours ago. I'm gonna make this a short one since I'm on my phone and on lunch. Me again from the animal shelter, which is a magnet for the crazy and over-entitled of the world. Enter 60-year-old entitled grandma. She comes into our shelter with this tiny little poodle that is skin and bones, missing hair and blind and seemingly deaf. Well, entitled grandma brings this dog in and says it's a stray she found. We ask her the basics. Do you live in this county? Is one of the biggest questions we ask. See, what some people don't know is that every county in a state has its own county animal shelter or animal control facility. Any stray animal found must be brought to that county shelter, usually within 48 hours of finding the animal. It is illegal to take a stray animal from one county and surrender it to an animal shelter in a different county that you don't live in. Now, that being said, Entitled Grandma doesn't live in this county. However, she claims to have found this dog running down the road in our county. Okay, it happens. We take the dog in and I get called to do its medical exam. I make sure the dogs and cats and whatever else we get have their proper shots and medications so they don't get sick while here or if they are sick so we can at least start getting them healthy. This requires a lot of wrestling with big animals that could hurt me if they timed it just right who don't want to take their pill or get a shot. So I take the little poodle into the back and first thing I do is scan any animal coming in for a microchip. Chip comes up instantly. I research the chip and sure enough, it's from the next county over that Entitled Grandma lives in. Registered to that county's animal control. This is a red flag for me. This tells me it's her dog. However, I follow through and contact the next county's animal control. They pull up the chip number and give me the owner's name, address, and phone number. It's not Entitled Grandma. Okay, I think to myself, well, I've been wrong before. I call the owner on the chip. The owner isn't Entitled Grandma, but it turns out the owner is Entitled Grandma's daughter. Me. Hello, uh, is this Entitled Grandma's daughter? Daughter. Yes, who is this? Me. Yeah, I'm OP from County Animal Shelter. Are you missing a small elderly poodle? No. No, I got a poodle for my mother, entitled Grandma, as a present back in 2016. Did it get lost? Me. No. Your mother brought it in and told us it was a stray she found. She falsified information on a government form and abandoned her animal. These are pretty serious issues. She needs to come get her dog now. I understand, and I will call her and make sure she comes in and gets her dog back. About a half hour goes by and my desk phone goes off. It's entitled Grandma's Daughter's Number. I think, okay, this is them telling me they're coming back. Nope. Me. County Animal Shelter, this is OP speaking. Entitled Grandma's Daughter sounds very frustrated. Yes, this is Entitled Grandma's Daughter calling back. Uh, Entitled Grandma isn't coming back for the dog. She says she doesn't want it anymore because she thinks it's old and ugly. She demanded I get her a teacup chihuahua instead. Me. Well, that's between you and her. But either you or her need to come get this dog, as it's an actual crime to surrender your animal to a shelter in a county you don't live in, let alone the animal abandonment charges and putting down false information on a government form. Daughter. I understand, but I work in another county and can't make it in time to get the dog. Me. Then your mother needs to be an adult and come get her dog. She's got till the end of the day. Otherwise, we will be filing a police report. Daughter. Well, she's old. She shouldn't have to deal with this kind of stress. Me. She should have considered that before she lied to us and abandoned her animal. Have you even seen this dog? It's skin and bones. You are aware that animal cruelty is a felony in this state, right? Fine. I'll come get her darn dog. Me. We close at posted hours. She hangs up. I go to lunch. I doubt I will see her or her mother, but I'm true to my word. If they don't get here by the end of the day, they're going to be dealing with the police instead of us. Edit. Quick update. With three minutes left to go till we close and no entitled grandma's daughter or entitled grandma in sight, this will now become a police matter. I gave entitled grandma plenty of time to get here, 
Now they can deal with felony charges. Edit 2. No word from Entitled Grandma's daughter or Entitled Grandma either. I doubt they'll show up again at this point. The poodle is doing great though. She's getting the food and medication she needs and already seems more energetic. The plus side is in shelters. The smaller dogs always tend to get adopted first. So once she is medically cleared for adoption, she will most likely get a home that day. Do you have any pets like a cat or a dog? Please leave me a comment letting me know. Next we've got, yes, I was a student here. Eight years ago, background. My parents used to host foster kids until they could be placed with their adoptive parents. They did this from 2015 to 2019. This happened in 2018. This particular kid we had, and I'll call her Annie for this story. Annie was 11 when this happened. Annie was a sweet girl who had just lost her parents and my parents hosted her until her grandparents could adopt her. While my parents did host foster kids, I would often help out with taking them to school and doctor's appointments since I worked the evening shift at my job. Annie ended up going to some middle school that I did and I know several of the teachers and office staff that still work there. And yes, this will be important. Cast. We've got me. We've got teacher. We've got Annie. We've got Mrs. G, Godmama, and secretary. And we've got Mrs. B, the principal. So like I said, this happened in 2018. My foster sister Annie was in school. It was around 10 in the morning when my mom got a call from the school that my sister had started her monthly. Oh boy. I grab lady things and some pain relievers to help with her stomach cramps. I go to school and see Mrs. G, the secretary and my godmother, who waves me through after I verified my identity. We have to do this for safety reasons. I go into the waiting area and sit there looking at my phone. Then I hear the dreaded, hmm. I look up to see this teacher looking at me with disgust. Oh boy. Me. Can I help you? Teacher. Why aren't you in your uniform? It's not a free dress day. Me. Uh, I'm not a student here. I'm waiting for my sister to give her a change of clothes. Now, before the teacher could finish, Annie walks in, looking embarrassed as heck. Annie. Hey, kitty. My nickname. Me. Hey, munchkin. I brought some clean clothes for you. And go ahead and take some pain reliever meds. Annie takes the bag, and I give her a bottle of water so she can take the medicine. The teacher sees this and just freaks out, accusing me of giving her things that aren't allowed. But it was just some leave. Me. Ma'am, I told you. I'm her older sister. I came here to give her things for her stomach cramps. Teacher. There is no way you are her older sister. I want to see ID. Annie tries to get a word in, but I just shove her the bag. Now while all of this is going on, Mrs. G is watching us. As I said, Mrs. G is my godmother but I am also an adult who can handle things like this. I show her my driver's license, and of course, the teacher scoffs and just hands it back to me. This just proves you're in high school, and I don't care you're her oldest sister. You can't be here. I was born in 1997. Annie interjects. Ma'am, Kitty had her 21st birthday a few weeks ago. The teacher shushed her. At this point, Mrs. G is coming over. God bless her. Mrs. G walks over and asks what's going on. Teacher. Mrs. G, you need to report these two girls to the principal. Mrs. G. Why the heck should I do that? Kitty hasn't been here since 2010. But her ID. What about it? I've known Kitty since she was a baby. I'm her godmother. She would never lie about this. Teacher. I can't believe you. We are taking this to the principal. At this point, I just wanted to get home and poor Annie was just an anxious mess. Mrs. G told her to go take care of her business. Being polite, despite wanting to knock the teacher into next year, I went to the office, where at once the principal, Mrs. B, immediately greeted me with a big hug and asked how my sister was. Big sister went to the same middle school as me. I told her my sister is getting married soon. Then she gets right down to business. Mrs. B. Susan. I don't know the actual teacher's name, so it's Susan. What's the problem? Teacher. This student is lying and giving things that aren't allowed to her sister. Mrs. B just started to laugh. It was the first time I had ever seen her actually laugh. When I was in middle school, I never once saw her smile or laugh. Mrs. B. Lord. Susan, are you that dumb? Why the heck did I even hire you? Lord Almighty. Kitty is 21. For God's sake, Susan. Why the heck would you think that she's in high school? 
much less middle school. Go back to your class and let me reconsider hiring you. After that, the teacher, Susan, huffed off. Mrs. G, Mrs. B, and I had a good laugh. This is pretty common for me since I have a baby face, but most of the time it ends in awkward apologies. I've never had this happen to me, but it was nice to have someone back me up. I leave the principal's office and tell Annie to have a good rest of her day and I'll see her that afternoon. Next we've got, which would you choose? Bail out Karen or bail out your vehicle? A little backstory of my auntie. She is very entitled. Our relationship was strained after she revealed a very private conversation between the two of us and it led to a big fight. One thing about her is that she is very impatient. Her impatience has always led to trouble. This one time really made things difficult, but easily one of the most easiest decisions I have ever made. Several months ago, I needed to print my research paper about fabrics for my fashion class. My aunt insisted in joining me, even though I warned her that the printing would take about half an hour. She said she can wait that long since she had nothing to do. She has kids, but they were in school. So I reluctantly agreed for her to join. We arrived at the print shop and I told my auntie to wait in the car. First mistake. I went in and the clerk told me it would take 45 minutes as the research paper had over 120 pages. I called my auntie and told her it would take 45 minutes. She screamed at me saying, You said it was 30 minutes. I can't wait that long. Me. You said you had nothing to do. I told you it might take long and you didn't have to come. You do this all the time. Entitled Aunt. Get it done. Now. And I hang up. Now, some of you might ask why I didn't just drive her back. The print shop was really crowded, and it's like a dry cleaners with the number of tickets and such. My number was 31, and the number displayed was 25. There were at least 50 or 60 people in there, and there was no way to drive off because I would lose my place. About 10 minutes in, my auntie calls again. Are you done yet? Me. No. How much longer? About 30 minutes. Ugh, fine. And she hangs up. Not even five minutes later, she called me again. Where are you? Me. It hasn't even been five minutes yet. Let's go now. I can't. It's not even my turn. I don't care. Drive me back or else. Me. No, you won't. Entitled aunt. Watch me. I had to run out, but it was too late. My auntie drove my car away at full speed. So after that and the printing is done, I called an Uber and headed home. Soon as I came back home, my mother and stepdad were asking where Entitled Aunt was. Mom. Hey son, where is Entitled Aunt? Me. She took my car when she didn't want to wait. I told her it would take 45 minutes and she was annoying me. Stepdad goes pale. Son, you know Entitled Aunt doesn't have a license. Me, smirking. No, I did not know that. She said she did have one. I knew she didn't have one. Any idiot would already notice a fake ID if it's her handiwork. Stepdad. She is incapable of driving. I'm going to call uncle and he'll put an APB on Entitled Aunt and your car. I was giggling like a schoolgirl for the rest of the night. The next morning came and while my stepdad was out running a quick errand, he left his phone. It's not uncommon. He leaves his phone all the time. And I got a call from the police station. Police. Hello, is stepdad available? Me. No, this is his son, OP. Ah, so I take it you own this car then? Me. What? We got a call about an APB put on your car as one of your family members took it, right? It's come to my attention she doesn't hold the driver's license, correct? Me. She said she did. I saw her card. Yes, we saw that. Unfortunately, it's fake. You can bail her out, but you would have to pay undisclosed amount to get her out as what she did is a federal offense. Me. As for my car, you can pick it up with the payment of less. Undisclosed amount. Me. Okay, I'll come pick her up. I told my mom what happened and she gave me the money. I went to the police station and Entitled Aunt was there in the cage waiting for me. OP, thank God you're here. Save me. Me. Do you have what I need? Police. Yes, here it is. I paid and left. What did I bail out? Of course, my car. My mom said to let her suffer, so she gave me the money to bail out my car instead of her. She was released a few weeks later, but was given a harsh warning and also not being able to make her license for the next five years. She wasn't fined, as she admitted fault. Would you have bailed out your entitled aunt or your car instead? Please leave me a comment right now letting me know. Next we've got, D. 
destroys his own order, blames me. I don't even know who you are. I work in the bakery at a large chain grocery store. I don't make cakes slash cupcakes, but I do hand over orders to customers when they come to pick them up. Like most days, I was by myself, no department manager. This guy comes in and says he's here to pick up an order. Fine. I ask him for his name and he tells me. He ordered 30 rose cupcakes in a full sheet box. I wheel them out to him on our rolling table. He picks them up and drops them into his cart. Just dumps them. He then gets mad and blames me for dropping them. He then starts yelling at me because the cupcakes weren't exactly how he ordered them and that he needed them to be exactly right for his significant other. He insists I took the order, which is weird because the order wasn't in my handwriting, I hadn't been there when he claimed he ordered them, and I had never seen this guy before, and trust me, I'd remember this guy. I show him the order form and he snatches it out of my hands. I'm trying to de-escalate and this guy keeps yelling at me. I casually place my hand on his cart and he jerks the cart away. The most I'm allowed to offer is 50% off, which I do. He wants none of it and refuses to take the cupcakes. At this point, I decide I've had enough and go get the manager on duty. As I walk back with the assistant store director, I fill him in on the customer and warn him that this guy's in a mood. When assistant store director and I get back to my department, customer has the box open and is messing with the cupcakes. Director introduces himself and asks what the problem is. I stand next to the counter with my best poker face on. Customer explains that he ordered them just so, that I took the order, that I dropped them, yada yada. Director offers customer the cupcakes free of charge if he will leave now. Customer refuses, yells at us again, I'm never coming to this store again, and leaves without the cupcakes. Director and I just look at each other. Nee, I told you he was something. Director leaves and I wheel the cupcakes back into my department. All the adrenaline I'd been holding back released because I was concerned this guy was going to get violent. I knew some martial arts, but I don't know how I'd fare against an angry fat guy who looks like he works with his hands. All the yelling and yelling and snatching things away had put me on edge. Once my hands stopped shaking, I made a note explaining why the cupcakes were still here and went back to work. About 15 minutes later, the phone rings. Guess who it is? Customer. I want to talk to the bakery manager. Me. She's not in today, as I told you earlier. Well, then who the heck did I talk to? That would be the director, the store manager. Let me talk to him. I transfer him. A few minutes later, director pages me to the office. I was a little concerned, but nothing I couldn't explain. Director gestures for me to take a seat. Director. You're not in trouble. That customer called back and asked if the offer of free cupcakes was still valid. I told him they are not for sale to him at any price. And if he talks to any of us like that again, he will be banned from the store. I'm going to have you write a statement and sign and date it in case he goes to corporate. I did so, and then he wrote his statement on my paper and signed it. We chatted for a few minutes about it and I went back down. The whole incident was caught on camera, further corroborating our accounts. Nothing ever did happen. I did keep a broomstick within easy reach just in case he came back for vengeance for ruining his whatever, but I never saw him again. I was grateful Director is a super chill guy who had my back the whole time. He saw a customer messing with the cupcakes and saw that he was trying to make me look worse. We did everything right. We were calm and polite. He was looking for a fight. I'm just glad it happened to me instead of my more timid coworker who sometimes has my shift. I can take this stuff with a straight face. I don't know how she would have fared. We ended up selling the non-damaged cupcakes individually in the case to get rid of them. So it wasn't a total loss for us. Director got assigned to another store a few months ago, but he's still the best director I have ever had and he is missed. I put a Brad in time out and titled Mom Wants to Sue. About five years ago, when I was 20, I used to work as a yard supervisor at the local elementary school while I was on break from college. Wasn't much, but I'd get at least a month's worth of work in the summer and then a week in the winter. They were super lenient with my hours probably because they tended to be short-handed and also my mother worked at the school as a teacher too. I've told this story to so many people so many times, people might recognize me on here, but whatever. If you don't know what a yard supervisor is, we're the people who stand in the lunchroom or on the playground during recess and make sure everyone is behaving. Basically, glorified babysitters. I was the youngest of my coworkers since the others who worked there were women who had kids that attended that school. For some background, 
This school was in the rich part of town. The kind of elementary school situated in a nice suburban neighborhood where everyone has a Cadillac SUV and maybe a BMW, Mercedes, or Tesla as their second car. And they loved to try to solve all their inconveniences with lawyers. I always thought it was a stereotype that the rich people in town would threaten you with their lawyers when they didn't get what they wanted. Most of the time, they were bluffing though. Anyways, among the fourth graders at this school, there was this kid named Hannah. Honestly, don't remember, but her name may have actually been Hannah. I doubt it matters though. She was your classic playground bully. Notorious liar. Loved to pick on anyone smaller than her. Which, considering her, uh, size, there were plenty kids for her to choose from. And had quite the temper. She was also supposed to be in fifth grade, but had been held back a year. And she had this other girl named Sierra as her crony. Hannah always initiated the trouble and would boss Sierra around to do her bidding. She would even turn on Sierra occasionally. One time, I witnessed Hannah shove Sierra and then run up to me telling me Sierra shoved her. Sierra, getting mad, would then shove Hannah and at this point I'd send them both to the principal's office and to my knowledge, they'd just get off with a warning. Sierra is not important to this story though. Just wanted to add that bit so you can kind of picture Hannah and her like Scoot Farkas and his crony. The situation was almost identical. None of my coworkers, including Hannah's teacher, liked Hannah. She was notorious for causing trouble and then making up elaborate lies to cover herself. Everyone knew this and had warned me when I first started the job. If you're wondering why nothing was ever done or why this kid never got therapy, I have no idea. This was the US public education system and also her mother was a jerk, which I'll get to later. One day I'm working in the lunchroom and I overhear Hannah calling another student names and making them cry. Supposedly she had also hit him, but none of us witnessed it, though we wouldn't put it past her. We remove Hannah from the table and make her sit at this table we have reserved for delinquents while we write up a note to send to the principal. At best, she would get detention or perhaps a couple days suspension, since this is a recurring problem. The bell for recess rings and we make Hannah stay inside and sit at the table in time out. No recess for her that day. The rest of the story I was not here for. I was only told the rest by my coworkers the next day. Hannah, returning to class, goes to her teacher and tells her, the young yard duty hit me and called me names. I'm the young yard duty being 20 while my coworkers were at least in their 40s. The teacher knows she's lying and tells her to take it up with the principal, since such a claim is serious. Hannah doesn't like the principal, so she instead, after school, goes to one of the other yard supervisors and tells her the same thing. That yard supervisor was working with me in the lunchroom that day and knew no such thing happened and tells her not to tell lies. Hannah, of course, then goes to her mom. Hannah's mom had as much as a reputation around the school as Hannah did for being just an all-around unpleasant person. Hannah's mom is also under the impression that her daughter could never do any wrong and that the school was constantly trying to pick on her. I think her claim was the school was bullying her for being fat or too pretty. It was one or the other, maybe both, since my only knowledge about this came from my coworkers. So, you can probably guess her reaction when Hannah told her the story she made up. Hannah's mom, entitled mom for now, goes straight to the school principal, starts yelling at the principal, and demands legal action be taken. The principal, having been already notified of Hannah's behavior in the lunchroom that day, and being well acquainted with both Hannah and entitled mom's behavior, told entitled mom the real story. Entitled mom insists I must have actually done this, and that she's been bullied this entire time at school, and that saying Hannah did these things must be me trying to cover my butt, and that I must be on a power trip or something. She demands a lawsuit against me and wants me in the office to face her. I had already left work for the day, and the principal was under no obligation to call me and didn't care to entertain entitled mom with her antics anyway. The principal then tells her, if I did do these things, then she should file a police report. Entitled mom agrees, but this is where Hannah snaps. For some reason, perhaps just the way police are portrayed to kids as these heroes who will find you out, Hannah is terrified of the thought of having to talk to the police. So finally Hannah starts crying 
and spills that she made it up and that nobody had hit her and that she was just mad about missing recess for a timeout. Entitled Mom, of course, now believes Hannah had been coerced into admitting this because why would her little angel lie? Entitled Mom storms out of the office, claiming she'll still get her lawsuit and that's the last I hear about her. No lawsuit ever came, thankfully because I know my broke college butt would never be able to afford it. Many of my coworkers told me that they've had lawsuits threatened on them from various parents aside from Entitled Mom, but they never came to anything. It was almost a game for how many lawsuit threats you could get during your time at that school. One of my coworkers, before she ended up being fired for a claim Hannah made against her, that's another story. Principal didn't get a choice in it and our school board, which was also just crappy in more ways than one, decided she had too many claims against her and that she should be let go, taught me a great quote from that ordeal. The bad apple doesn't fall too far from the bad tree. Have you ever dealt with bullies when you were in school? Please leave me a comment letting me know. Next we've got, when Karen used disabled students against me, she didn't expect this. Back in 2003, when unemployed, I decided to volunteer at a local education facility that specializes in helping out young to late teen kids with Down syndrome or high levels of autism which causes themselves to be antisocial. I hate not being able to work, so volunteering not only got myself out of my boring doing nothing everyday schedule, but also gave me a positive when applying for work. Everyone likes someone who is always trying to better themselves. It is a great place with some great people who also volunteer and the kids are imaginative and show love unconditionally. The local community was also amazing donating items, clothes, food, and money to help keep the facility running. Just shy of two years later, after many people coming and going, Karen appears. At first, she has a nice smile and is accommodating. The kids seem to love her a lot, until the jealousy started. Karen didn't understand for the last two years, I have been doing volunteering even when doing part-time jobs I could find, so she assumed I was just recently new. So when the kids always came to me to give hugs and tell me what they did that day and show off their art, well, Karen didn't like this, and she was jealous of my popularity with everyone. This started a spate of things happening. I was a smoker at that time. Not anymore. Have quit since seven years ago. Best thing ever. So a rule was to make sure lighters, matches, and cigarettes were locked away in lockers at all times. This included medication, mobile phones, anything that could be a bad thing in the wrong hands. Although the kids would tell anyone that something that was sitting out in the open that shouldn't be there was there, and we would put them away. But this one day, Karen had gone to the manager slash HR administrator to say that I had left my cigarettes out with my lighter, an electronic one which was unique. I was busy that day, so I was apologetic as I could have easily forgotten as you are kept off your feet constantly. But in the back of my mind, I had a doubt that I'm sure I put them in my locker. Over four months, every two to three weeks, something else was left in the open or a door to the cleaning closet was left open after I had used the equipment inside. Each time, Karen had went to the manager slash HR to talk about this. Karen has kids of her own that left after they hit 18, so at the time, I'm putting it down to automatic motherly defensiveness for the kids. The following month, one of the girls, we'll call her Joe, not her real name, had burst into the room crying and her nose was bleeding. All the volunteers, including myself, instantly went to check up on Joe. She is looking flustered. Looking at me and gave a big yell, she ran off to hide. When Joe was flustered or upset about something, she would always hide, but she always came to me first to say why or to hint at why, but this time she didn't. And then Karen burst in. How could you do this to Joe? Devil eyes peering at me. I am taken aback. What? Who? What do you mean? What happened to Joe? She replied. I can't believe I just watched you five minutes ago sock her in the face and she rushed off to the manager slash HR. I'm standing there, unsure of what the heck is going on. Joe in the corner somewhere behind boxes crying her eyes out. Some new volunteers are looking at me as if I'm bad, and the other kids are looking perplexed because I've never done this at all before. Even with Down syndrome, they understand most of what is going on around them. 
Manager comes in quickly, looking angry, which is understandable hearing what Karen told her. Asked me why I did this. This shocked me hard because here's the manager who's known me for the last 2.5 years and instantly thought I could do something like that. I deny it, of course. I have been in the room for at least 25 minutes. The others couldn't corroborate as we are always busy and we don't notice small things like who is in the room and for how long. The manager goes to Joe and asks her. She looks at me and instantly sobs her heart out again and says with a stammering, yes. This hit me harder than the manager instantly thinking I could do this. Joe has been like a little sister who would tell me everything and always came to me when in trouble. So police were called, everyone given information. Joe was too scared, still in her place of hiding. So I was effectively let go pending an investigation. Hardly anyone gets reinstated after any type of investigation, but Joe's parents were seemingly at a loss for words and didn't think I could do this. And after talking to Joe on their own, they dropped charges. But the damage was done and I was asked to never come back. Later found out that Karen and her jealousy was telling other newer volunteer staff that I was always breaking rules and leaving dangerous stuff about. She had watched me at my locker, digital number keypad type, and saw my pin for the locker and left things about, including the lighter and cigarettes, all because the kids would always come to me. Fast forward to 2009, after lots of rejections from other places for volunteering, one place was run by an ex-volunteer who knew this was all BS and gave me a chance. She was great and understanding. We would help all types of people in the community to do events for charities, etc. I enjoyed it very much. One day, the boss came to me and said, Oh, guess who is coming with kids today? Karen. Since years back, Karen has moved up the ranks, so to speak, and had, through some rumors, forced the manager to quit. So wanted the ex-volunteer who ran this place to help the kids put on a play so she can show it off to a regional director who helps fund the facility I used to volunteer at. Oh boy, oh boy. Luckily, Karen never gets to see me. She talked to the person who runs the place I'm at now. Everything is arranged, and the kids would come twice a week for five months to work on and rehearse their play they would put on. Sort of real-life situations that they meet in their lives and how to overcome them. And of the eldest kids is Joe. She sees me and rushes over to me and hugs me, crying at the same time, saying, sorry, 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 about what seemed like forever. I patted her head and said it's okay, because I know she was coerced into it. It fit the scenario. Joe told me everything she could about Karen. She had socked Joe, told her to blame me. She wouldn't. Then she got socked again the same spot, this time with a threat to tell it was me or she would never come back here and go to the bad place, which was a publicly funded place, which isn't really good. Light bulb moment. Real life situation and how to overcome them. I got in touch with Joe's parents and they were so apologetic because Joe told them everything and they tried to tell the manager slash HR before, but she put it down to Joe isn't sure and just wanted me back. So I told them of the play and if we could introduce Joe's experience with Karen as part of the play. They were hesitant at first, but after a couple of hours, I got a text on my phone. Yeah, go for it. Take that lying jerk down. So months go by. Joe knew not to tell anyone about the play. It was a secret. Then it was time for the big night. Room is packed. Other groups did their choirs, plays, artistic dances. It was a great night. I looked through the thick wine curtains at the stage to see Karen, looking all pleased with herself next to the director. Apparently, this was make or break for Karen. Please the director, get the manager position, which was a paid position and not volunteer. She was temporary manager and being paid, but this would solidify it. Then the kids came on. Each group did their own things. They were amazing and people were enjoying it. Some jokes here and there that we helped the kids remember. Then Joe was last a solo performance. Joe stood on the stage and in her best voice, My Time at the Facility by Joe. I'm watching Karen through the curtain and she's looking perplexed, forcing a smile at the director who was loving it and was paying super attention to all the kids. Who wouldn't be if you are funding them? So I stepped to the side of the curtain and then eventually Karen's eyes met my face and I cheekily waved. 
and then her face became one of massive concern. Job put on an amazing performance, and the piece de resistance was her solo part about Karen. In the dark, with a light shining on Joe for dramatic effect, she mimicked what happened to her that day. That hurt me, Karen. Why did you do this to me? You did this to me, not OP. Then she covers her nose again. No, Karen, don't do it again. I don't want to leave here. I will do it. She stands up straight from her crouched position and says, Karen told me to lie and say OP did this or I would go to the bad place. The director's face was unforgettable. He sat with his jaw literally hanging down and mouth agape. Karen was looking at me, at Joe, at the director back and forth, back and forth, and you could see her trying to figure out something to save herself. I just walked backstage. Job done. Later, I high-fived Joe and told her good job. You were amazing. She gave me the biggest, cheesiest grin with a thumbs up. Made me tear up. Karen blamed me for obviously making Joe say all these things, and police were called again. But my boss didn't take her side, of course, and allowed me to remain. For years, Karen would always serve me up some weird summons to court for one thing or another. I would go, and she wouldn't, so I automatically win. One of the girls who was at the facility when I was there was Meg. Again, not real name. She was bullied by Karen to say stuff about me, but Meg would say no every single time. Meg's parents gave her a bear she called Barry the Bear. Barry was special. It had a camera. So she would have the bear, and if anything bad happens, she knew to press the bear's paw to start recording. But unfortunately, Meg lost her battle with MS March of last year, and they were going through her things, and the father found Barry the Bear and remembered why they got it. They went through what was recorded. Now back then, things like this did exist, but were heavy and expensive and without much storage. Well, Joe was playing with Barry the Bear as Meg allowed her to play with him. They were good friends. Joe must have accidentally pushed the paw to start the recording, and on the recording you could hear Karen in the background, the threats, etc. So Meg's parents told me about this, and that started me down the legal route to finally get Karen for good. It resulted in going to court, and after a day, they found Karen guilty. She was banned and fined $50,000 and was to pay damages to me, Joe, and Meg's parents. Unfortunately, the stigma I received back then never did go away, and I can't still go back to the facility to volunteer even after the truth. But that is okay. I'm currently going to start another new job and will volunteer at weekends. But I know that Karen and her ambitious jealousy is now having the worst time ever. Everyone in the community knows what she did, and she has become a bit of a recluse and hardly ventures anywhere. Next we've got, I made the mistake of wearing a bright red hoodie to Target. This happened to me over the weekend, so the dialogue is just the gist of what happened. I don't have as good of a play-by-play -play memory as some people. I had stopped by Target to grab some snacks on my way home to watch the NFL playoff games. I was on my phone trying to find out what kind of chips and stuff people would want when I got approached by a lady asking what section buns were in. She asked nicely, said, excuse me, and all that, so I gladly helped her. Didn't cross my mind that she might have come up to me because she thought I worked there. After she left, I went back to my phone, kinda aimlessly looking between chips on the shelf and read it while I waited for someone to message back. That's when I realized my error in clothing choices. Another lady in the aisle, this one with her kid and less courteous, had walked up closer to me while I was helping the other. After I went back to my phone, she started to clear her throat while standing uncomfortably close. I thought maybe I was in her way, so I just sort of sidestepped and went about my day. Mind you, I'm holding a red basket this entire time. This apparently was the most disrespectful thing this woman had ever seen because it sent her off the rails. Karen, who do you think you are ignoring me? Me, excuse me? Karen, I've been waiting patiently for you to help me and you're just on your phone texting on the clock. Then you're just gonna decide to help some random who walks up to you before me? I'm taking this to your manager. She then proceeded to snatch the phone from my hand throw it in her purse and start to walk off, all while dragging her kid behind her who's doing his best to make himself invisible. I ran in front, 
stretched my arm out and demanded she give me back my phone. I told her I don't work here, and if she doesn't, I'll be happy to go find a manager for her. Karen, I'll give it back to you after you get a manager. This is unacceptable. Ni, nee. ma'am, I seriously do not work here. Please give me my phone. Karen, manager first. Me, fine, forget it, follow me. We then proceeded to walk to the front, all while she was giving her kid a lecture about how important it is for him to always be respectful to others. My eyes still hurt from how hard I rolled them. Soon as we got to the front help desk, I asked them where a manager was. They pointed out a guy in a button-up shirt I'll call Bob. Me, excuse me sir, this woman has stolen my phone and refuses to return it. Do you know who I can talk to about theft? Bob, I'm sorry, what? Karen, this employee is lying. I caught him slacking off on his phone and refusing to help me. She then proceeded to go on and on about never being able to find anything and how no one here is helpful while she handed my phone to Bob. Bob, sir, is this your phone? Me, yes, she snatched it out of my hands, put it in her purse and walked away. Who can I talk to about theft? Bob, I can have someone escort her out, but we have a courtesy officer in the store if you would like me to find him. Me, that's fine, kicking her out would be enough. Karen, escort me out? For what? He wasn't doing his job. Bob, ma'am, this man does not work here. I'm going to have to ask you to leave. You took a customer's personal belongings. She began to make even more of a scene, alternating between trying to apologize to me, yelling insults at the manager motioning her toward the door, and yelling about how they can't kick her out and that she had a right to be here. I felt bad for her kid, but I really wasn't in the mood to have my phone stolen. Karen claimed she was next. Spoiler alert, she wasn't. It's a Karen story. Everybody loves a good Karen story. This particular Karen was a regular, a regular pain in the neck. I've got a few stories with her. Something to know about her, she usually starts the interaction by shoving her phone with an image of what she wants into the face of whichever unlucky associate is available to help her, instead of, you know, speaking to them like an actual human being. So a new game had just come out, Days Gone for the PS4. It was fairly popular and the demand was a bit more than our supply. This story happens the day after launch day when copies are running out. Another thing to know is, as employees, we are allowed to check out pretty much any game in the store, subject to manager approval, for up to four days. Generally, managers only decline the request if it's a AAA title just released or if we are low on copies. The manager in this case was pretty lax and let a coworker check days gone out on launch day. He only took the disc, so the display case was still on the shelf. One last tidbit, all the game cases on the sales floor are empty. We take one copy of each game we have, take it out of the case, and put it in a drawer with a disc sleeve while the empty case goes out on the sales floor to show people we have it in stock. Karen knew this as well. Some savvy people can figure it out, which will become relevant. We have two copies of the game left, not counting the one checked out, and there are three people in line. A regular who we'll call Paul, a normal customer, and then Karen. Paul comes up and says he wants to get Days Gone. I go to get it for him, but before I ring it up, he stops me. Wait, actually, let me check to make sure I've got enough for it, he said, and stepped to the side to check his bank account on his phone. You can go ahead with them for now, he said as he motioned to the line. Now, he wasn't indicating everybody currently in the line, just the line as a general concept, a concept that Karen would prove that she didn't understand. So I take the next guy, and big surprise, he wants days gone. I get it for him, and as I'm ringing it up, I casually say to Paul, Hey, just so you know, we only have one copy left. He replies, Okay, yeah, I'm good to get it, thanks, and stays off to the side, as Karen has moved up and he didn't want to get in her personal space. I finish with a normal customer and get ready to motion Paul over when suddenly a phone in my face. Karen, with her stupid phone, takes me by surprise. I didn't even see what was on the screen. It was so jarring. I say, I'm sorry, ma'am. He was actually next, pointing to Paul. She barks. No, he wasn't. I was. He said I could go. I reply. 
Well, he was at the front of the line and just stepped out to check something, but he was still here first. Paul didn't want any trouble, so he says, It's fine, she can go ahead. She perks up and says, See? I told you I was next. Whatever, you imbecile. I say, Alrighty then, what can I get for you? The phone in my face again. God, I can't stand this lady. It doesn't take me long to decipher the grainy photograph as days gone, and now I'm worried about what might transpire, and I'm not really sure what to say. I reason that Paul was indeed first, so he should have the right of first refusal. Days gone, we actually only have one copy left, and I think Paul was going to buy it, I say, including Paul in the conversation. At this point, it appears that Paul doesn't want to give Karen any more niceties, so he says, Oh, I'm sorry ma'am, I did actually want that game, and I was here first, sorry. But you said I could go first, and I want that game for my son. You can't take back what you said now, she says, thinking she's found a loophole in his words or something. I say, I'm sorry ma'am, but he was actually here first, and I don't think there's anything else I can do aside from checking a nearby store for you. I pretty much always suggest this when a game runs out, but apparently that wasn't good enough for her. She does step aside though, and says, Well then, I'm going to call my son, and you're going to have to tell him that you sold his copy. I had zero intention of doing that, not only because she was a jerk, but I never handle other people's phones for hygienic reasons. She doesn't pry me for a response, so I ignore her and help Paul. Sorry about that, I say as I ring him up. It's cool, I know stuff like that must happen every now and then, he says. Buddy, you have no idea. I get him rung up and he leaves, and Karen is still on the phone. She's casually looking at the shelves, and her eyes zero in on the display case for days gone. Hey, what's this? She says, and hangs up the phone, and rushes over to the display case and picks it up. That's just the display case for the game, but we don't have any more. I respond, Yes you do! When you have one of these out, the real case, it means you have one left. I want it, she demands. I normally never mention the checkout process to customers, as most employees don't, since it just causes problems. But I would also not lie to a customer about it, rather I would deflect it. I'm sorry ma'am, but as I said, we're sold out. I'm more than happy to check a nearby store for you. No, if you have this case out here, and you don't have any in stock, that means that one of the employees checked it out, right? I'm sorry ma'am, but we don't have any copies available. You didn't answer my question. I'm afraid I can't answer that question for you, but we don't have any copies available. Well, I'm going to assume I'm right then. Good job, genius. I demand to know which employee has it. Now, I've had incidents with her before, but she had never demanded something so insane as this. Ma'am, I'm truly sorry. But we don't have the game. We just don't have it. I know one of you has it. It's you, isn't it? You're the one that checked it out, probably. You have to go home right now and bring it back. I'll even be nice enough to wait for you. I honestly didn't even know how to respond at this point. Luckily, my manager had just come back from break. She rolled her eyes when she saw Karen because she always causes a ruckus. You! Your employee here is refusing to sell me the game he has checked out. That's terrible customer service. Karen barks at Lena, my manager. Lena steals herself and says, Give me a moment to clock in and I'll be right with you. She goes in the back to put away her purse, comes back and clocks in. She turns to me and asks me to bring her up to speed. Karen tries to butt in a couple of times, but Lena just casually tells her to wait until I'm done. After I finish, Lena says, well, I'm sorry ma'am, but it looks like we're sold out. Almost happy that she had let the game be checked out since it ticked Karen off. I can check to see if another store nearby has it for you. Karen was livid. No, that's horrible customer service. I know he, points to me, has it at home. Make him go and get it. Lena says, ma'am, please keep your voice down or I will ask you to leave the store. Karen calms down a bit and says, but you can't treat people this way. It's not fair. You have this case out here. It's the original game case, so I know you have one copy left. I'm sorry for yelling, but it really is poor customer service if you don't let me have the game. Lena looks almost saddened at Karen's state and decides to level with her. Look, Karen, 
Yes, there is one copy of the game in our inventory, but it is currently unavailable to sell. Not that it matters, but OP here is not the one who checked it out. However, it is a privilege that we get as employees of the store and there is nothing wrong with us exercising that privilege. Now, I'm sorry that we don't have the game available for you today, but the best I can do is offer to check if another store nearby has it. Karen finally seemed to realize that her tirade wasn't helping and relented. Lena called the store 10 minutes down the road and had them hold a copy for Karen. Karen didn't apologize for her behavior though, as this was not the last incident I had with her. Would you have gone home to get the game for Karen? Please leave me a comment letting me know. College professor grades me incorrectly, then harasses me online. I have been debating on posting this story for the past couple years now, and this happened in the middle of my college career. I often find myself thinking about this insane woman and the ridiculous things that happened during this class and the following semester, which is why I want to get this story off my chest and hopefully amuse some other people. This post will probably be pretty long because I need to describe all the insane policies slash things she did while teaching this class, as well as the aftermath and how I got revenge. So buckle in. First off, I was a college student in my junior year when this incident happened. My college is a pretty good engineering school and I am a STEM major. I was required to take a professional and technical communications class as a part of my degree. Basically, a class on how to write technical documents and give professional presentations. Now, as a STEM major, I consider myself a somewhat awkward person and do not like speaking to large groups, so I knew this class would not be enjoyable. I also have always tried to achieve high grades and work hard in my whole educational career, so while I knew I would not enjoy this class, I also knew it would be like every other class and I would try my best. I am used to difficult engineering courses involving math, algorithms, equations, etc. So while I knew this class would be different than what I was used to, I did not expect it to be overly time consuming slash difficult. Let me just say now, this class took more of my time than all of my other STEM classes combined together that semester. To start, this professor was one of those professors that believed the traditional way lecturing slash taking notes was not effective. Instead, one time a week, she would split the class into groups of three to four students, give each student a section of a chapter to read, and we would give a short presentation on the material to the class. Now, I understand this was basically a glorified speech slash writing class, so I understood where she was coming from and did not complain. However, for every single presentation like this, remember one per week, there would be a total of three grades for it. She would grade our presentation, a random student not in the group would grade our presentation, and we ourselves would grade our own presentation. This meant that missing even one presentation resulted in three zeros, so I knew I had to try my best to never miss a class. Obviously, we would always give ourselves a 100 when we self-graded, and the random student chosen would always give good grades, but she would always find something wrong and give 80s. This three grades per presentation will become extremely important later. Next, she also had frequent writing assignments. Even though I am a STEM major, I have always excelled in English slash writing classes. I was always in honors slash AP English in high school and ace the required college English. However, she would always grade extremely harshly on these writing assignments and I would always get high C's or low B's on them. Whatever. For the midterm, she had us break into groups of three and we had a game show type of test. She would ask random, extremely specific questions about the chapters we gave presentations on and we had to write the answers on the board. If our answer was unintelligible, basically if she didn't like your handwriting, misspelled or grammatically wrong in any way, she wouldn't accept the answer. It was completely up to her discretion. If you got the answer right, you got a tally and the group with the most points got an A on the midterm. The next group got an A-, minus. the next highest group got a B+, plus, and so on. This is hands down the strangest and worst way I have ever seen an exam being given during my college career, but whatever. My group got third, so we got a B plus. She also had other random miscellaneous assignments throughout the semester she considered to be in different categories. So we had the chapter presentations, writing assignments, midterm, etc. as different categories. For final grades, as stated in the syllabus, she would calculate your grade for each category and each category would have different weights. I don't remember how it went exactly, but presentations could be 
writing could be 15%, etc. Now something I haven't mentioned yet was the category of bonus points. To counteract her harsh grading slash ability to lose large amounts of points from missing a presentation, she would give bonus points throughout the semester. So I knew I needed to get as many bonus points as possible to guarantee an A in the class. There were various ways to get bonus points, but I remember the strangest was a basketball completion we had in class that involved throwing paper balls into a trash can that ran across the room and a paper plane making competition during class, tuition well spent. During the basketball competition, I was the only one to make the paper into the basket and honestly, it was super lucky, but worth a ton of bonus points. When I successfully made the shot, I was shocked and could tell she didn't expect anyone to make it, but she acknowledged that I had earned a large sum of points. At the end of the semester, she claimed she would apply the bonus points to whichever grading category we were the lowest in, so it would help our grade the most. Another thing I have not mentioned is that my whole life I have suffered from general irritable bowel syndrome, IBS. It was so much worse when I was younger and certain foods trigger it more than others. I mostly have it under control now, but there are still days when I will get diarrhea and stomach pains and I cannot leave a bathroom for an hour. Well, one of those days happened during, you guessed it, one of the in-class presentations. I was unable to go to class that day, which resulted in three zeros. Before class had even started, I emailed her explaining that I would not be able to make it to class and I asked if I could make an appointment with her to discuss it. I knew I would be getting those three zeros, so I wanted to show her I wasn't just giving class and I wanted to be as proactive as possible. I had a meeting with her where I explained I have IBS. At the time, it was my mistake of not having it officially registered with my university that I have IBS, but I told her I could easily get her a doctor's note if she would like one. At the time, I was still seeing my pediatric gastrointestinal doctor that I had been seen since I was a baby, so he's had to write me many notes for school in the past. She acted like it was all fine, and she said she would exempt me from those three zeros. Even if she wasn't going to remove the zeros, I knew I had about 400 bonus points to make up for it. However, her next ridiculous stunt was about to be performed. About three-fourths of the way through the semester, at the beginning of class one day, she informs us that one of the students in my class had gone to the dean, her boss, and stated that the bonus point system was unfair. She informed us that all of the bonus points we had accumulated would be unusable because that student had broken the chain of command and not come to her with the issue. This was a major red flag to me. This was a small class, about 15 students, and throughout the semester, we had been complaining to ourselves about her, complaining about all of the work we were being given how she grades harshly, and the dumb midterm. As I stated earlier, this class was more time consuming than all my other classes combined. I believed she had developed a grudge against our class and wanted to take away our bonus points as a punishment. I later found out that no student had gone to the dean about the bonus points, so I can only conclude that I was correct in assuming she just hated our class. She stated that even though we wouldn't get any bonus points, she would drop the lowest grade from a grading category such that it would help our grade the most. Now it was at the end of the semester and we would be getting our final grades. There was no final exam for this class. There was a final project that was equally as ridiculous, but I've already said enough about this class's structure. But during exam week, I receive an email from her. It basically said that she was unable to exempt me from those three earlier zeros because it was unfair to the other students in the class. She was careful to word her email so that she did not admit she had ever exempted me from those zeros. When I checked my grades, she had removed the exempt status from them and they were now showing as zeros again. By this point, I was just done with this whole class. I didn't want to have to deal with her ever again, so I just accepted it and decided to move on. Like I said, this was during finals week and I was busy studying for many other difficult classes. When she published our final grades, she had given me a B-, minus which I thought was off. I went to check my grades to calculate it myself to verify, but she had removed all of the individual grades from the gradebook and just replaced it with the final grade. This was a massive mistake on my part because now I had no way to verify it. However, like I said, I just wanted to be done with all of this, so I grudgingly took the B- and moved on. I had a feeling that my grade seemed a little low and I knew that with these bonus points she had taken away, I could have at least had a B plus or possibly an A minus. The next summer rolls around and I had a class with another student from that previous class. As we were talking, 
we started discussing how dumb that class was, and he mentioned he also got a B- minus in the class, which he thought was low. He also mentioned how over the break, he tried to leave a review for her on one of those college professor review websites. However, he noticed his reviews would always be strangely removed from the website, and there would be many more high-ranking reviews following it. He suspected she was reporting bad reviews of herself to the website to somehow get them removed. There's a feature for this under every review. And then making positive fake reviews for herself. Well, I decided to make an accurate review of my experience of the class, which was obviously negative. I was stunned to see that minutes later, it was removed for violating the terms of service. I then began trying to make more negative reviews and I focused solely on the way the class was instead of reviewing her as a person. Each and every one of my reviews got taken down. In its place was a new review exclaiming how great the professor was and how some students were out to get her. This seemed to be directed at me trying to make a negative review. But again, I was just describing my negative experiences with the class. I then began to get angry and tried a loophole in the system. I gave her a negative review only containing one sentence that I was sure would not violate any of the rules and I reported the negative review myself and gave a BS reason for reporting it. I found that a review could only be flagged for review one time and once it was verified, nothing could be done to remove it. Using this method, I got a few negative reviews to stick and diminished her perfect rating on the website. I could tell this made her mad as a flood of positive reviews came in. However, these new reviews became oddly specific. It seemed that many of the reviews were directly referencing people in my class. Since this website is all anonymous, I believe she realized it was someone from our class because in my original reviews, I mentioned she had taken away our bonus points. Well, one of the new specific reviews was definitely mentioning me. The way she wrote it, she was writing the reviews as if it was me writing it. She wrote things like, I decided to skip class one day and got many zeros. So I went to professor and told her I had IBS. It did not work and I got a low B instead of an A. I was furious when I saw this because now I knew it had to be her doing this. I had not told anyone else that I had a meeting with her to discuss that incident, let alone that I had IBS. At this point, I decided this was getting too serious and I decided to stop messing with her on this website. I now believed this lady was insane and I did not want to press her further. So I was satisfied with a couple of negative reviews I got to stick and I thought that was it. I'm so glad that wasn't the end because this is the beginning of my revenge, even if I didn't know it at the time. The next day I get an email from the Dean of Students saying that I was required to meet with them to discuss it. I was extremely surprised by this and I already suspected it was related to this lady and the review website. Before this meeting, I had to call the office to acknowledge I had received the email and set up a meeting time. I asked the receptionist over the phone if she could give me any more information on why I was meeting the Dean. I played dumb on the phone and she said they had received an email from the review website saying that I specifically had been harassing her online. At this point, I was still in contact with some of the other students from the class and a few of them had also been summoned to the Dean, even though I was the only one involved with the review website. This told me she didn't know exactly who was doing it. So I contacted the review website and they said that under no circumstances would they ever contact a university like this. So now that I was going to the Dean of Students about this, I knew I now had the perfect chance for revenge. I wrote down a bullet point list of the crazy ways she taught the class, including the bonus point fiasco, midterm test, harsh grading, as well as the screenshots of her referencing my IBS on the review website, the way she hid the grades at the end of the class, and a doctor's note proving I have IBS to corroborate my three zeros being exempt then not exempt. When I went, I basically recounted the entire story as I described it above. Not only did the dean believe me, but they had already concluded that the email received from the review website was fake and did not actually come from them. I also showed proof of my contact with the review website and them saying they would never contact a university. The dean was extremely helpful and when I described that I believed I could have been graded unfairly because my grades were hidden and how I knew my grade would have been better with the bonus points, she helped me set up an appointment with another dean who was her boss. The meeting with the dean of students ended with her basically saying they would be investigating this lady. Next, I had the meeting with the other dean who was her boss. When I met with him, I basically described the whole story again. He had already talked to the previous dean, so he knew most of the story already. He was able to request my individual grades. I was able to go through them 
and I found that she had in fact graded me incorrectly. Even without the bonus points, I was able to see that my grade should have been a B plus, even with those three zeros. She had given me a B minus. If you factor in the bonus points, my grade was an A flat. The dean was extremely apologetic and my grade was changed from a B minus to an A. He also told me, off the record, that no student had come to him during that semester to complain about the bonus points, so she had taken them away just because she didn't like our class. Now, I don't know for sure, but I believe that she had graded everyone in my class incorrectly and given us all grades that were lower than what they should have been. My meeting with this dean ended with him saying he would be investigating her as well. This all happened at the end of the semester. I originally took the class in fall and I spoke with the dean slash got my grade changed at the end of the following spring. But I had one final meeting with the dean of students the following fall, one full year from when I originally took the class. From that meeting, I learned that she no longer worked at the university, but she couldn't confirm whether she was fired for this incident or not. I have a strong feeling she was fired as a result of this, and I have a strong feeling she has graded my entire class incorrectly. In the end, I wouldn't have gotten my revenge if she didn't stupidly report me to the dean using a fake email, so I'm actually glad about that. If you have read this for this long, thank you. I hope all this makes sense, and I'm glad I never got to see or deal with this lady again. If you had a teacher who was being unfair, would you report them to their boss? Please leave me a comment letting me know. Next we've got, Karen threatens me with a lawsuit when I finally stand up to her. Backstory. I live in an apartment complex directly outside of the largest college campus in the US, so it's 99% students. Cost of living isn't cheap, but convenient for students who walk to class, so most people who aren't students choose to live in better areas further away. As for the quality of our apartment, it's truly a waste of money. We've lived here a couple years now and have had awesome neighbors and no complaints of noise. I have an upper and lower neighbor and can barely hear the upstairs neighbor ever and I know they party in their apartment. This mother moved in with her three kids a couple months ago and have been nothing but trouble for everyone around them in the complex, specifically my boyfriend and I, because we live right above her. We both work full time and are students and rarely have company over. But if we do, there's maybe one or two people. The weekend she moved in, we had one friend over. Weren't watching TV, weren't partying, and were just chilling on the couch, chatting at a totally reasonable, sober volume. I haven't met her at this point, and she spent nearly an hour banging on her ceiling continuously. Eventually, my boyfriend went downstairs to ask if everything was okay, and she ripped him a new one. Her kid's bedtime is at 8 p.m. We shouldn't be talking and laughing this late, etc. Whatever. We just assumed we were louder than we thought and tried to quiet down. 20 minutes passed and she was banging on the ceiling again. I know we were talking normally and I knew the walls aren't that thin. I decided to just go out to the bar to hang out because this lady was obviously stressed and it wasn't worth it. Fast forward a couple days, my boyfriend and I had to work at 5 a.m. He gets up at 4 and gets in the shower. She started banging on the ceiling again. It was enough to wake me up. Like most, I don't want to be woken up at 4 a.m. and after banging on the ceiling for 5 minutes straight, I go down there and ask her what's wrong. She said my boyfriend turning on the shower woke up her entire family. I apologized and said that he has to work soon and that's something that will happen frequently and that while I can hear the water in other apartments as well, it's so subtle that it's barely noticeable. She started to go off about how they had to wake up for school soon and just moved from an actual detached home. She said that in a super yikes tone and that her family isn't used to hearing other people shower. So we had to do our showering before 7 p.m. each night or she would email our landlord. I mentioned that our classes slash jobs usually go way past that but realized it was a lost cause when she obviously didn't give a hoot. Anyways, BS like this continued. I would see her and her kids walking in the halls and would smile and say hello at her and she would literally shield them from me and run away. Not that it matters, but I'm a 22-year-old girl with a lame backpack who just seems like any other normal person, nothing to be shielded from. Anyways, sorry for the length, but here's the kicker. I was woken up last week from more bangs on the ceiling. It was 3 a.m. and I tried so hard to just go back to sleep because we were obviously sleeping, no TV or anything. The knocking continued and I actually got nervous that she needed help or something. I woke my boyfriend up, a deep sleeper, and said I was worried and he said he's done checking on her for multiple reasons and to just go back to sleep. I couldn't sleep and thought since we weren't making noise maybe she needed help. 
I went down there and knocked on the door. She opened it, and I swear to everything blurted out, You winch! Literally, you winch. I was obviously appalled, not even because I was half asleep, and just sheepishly asked if she was okay or needed something. She said snoring has kept her and her kids up all night. I kid you not. I watched her go to her couch, it was in perfect view of the front door, and grab her sleeping kid off of it and screams, He's been up for hours because somebody in your apartment won't stop snoring. The baby definitely looked like it was very asleep, and she grabbed him and I just went off. I don't know exactly what I said, but it was basically about how she's crazy for expecting other people to not be human and make human noises when she moves into an apartment. I don't like confrontation, so my version of going off was more like nervously saying how it is. She then told me to come in to listen to my boyfriend snore, and I stepped in a tiny bit and didn't hear anything. Like I said, I'm a light sleeper. My boyfriend breathes heavily, but in no way does he really snore. I couldn't hear a darn thing from her apartment. I told her that and she got mad, told me to step in her room and sit on the bed, and that I could hear it much better. I obviously refused and left. The next day, my car was entirely buried in snow. I'm from out of state and mentioned that to her before, so she knew me from my license plate. I tried to shrug it off, even though it was obviously intentional due to the amount of snowfall and what was on my car, not to mention the shovel cleared parking lot all directly towards my car and her being the only neighbor who has beef, and called my job to tell them I'd be late, as I kid you not, my car was literally under a mound. Two days later, it happened again. I was so frustrated that I took all the snow from my car and put it into a pile, then after class slash work at night, completely buried her car. She has since contacted the landlord apparently and won't stop banging on my ceiling again all night. Like it's almost like she doesn't sleep. She told my neighbor, who also knows she's whack and has lived here as long as we have, and he told me that she said I made her kids miss school and the district is so mad that I need to contact them to explain the situation. This happened two days ago and I woke up to a handwritten note under my door saying she has photos and will be filing a police report for vandalism and if her kids get in trouble for missing school, I will be at fault. I'm so non-confrontational and upset that I just want to ignore her, but she's getting way too crazy. Do this next. Tap here on your screen to come see our new podcast playlist, where you'll find thousands of hours of the best stories you've ever heard. Or tap the one on the right. That episode is specifically just for you, based on other videos you've enjoyed the most.